Hi, I'm Charles Martinet, and you're listening to Scene World Podcast. It's the Scene World Podcast. I'm over here. He's over there. There's things. How's Hello. It going? Uh, in a minute, we have the Guru Meditation. So we're going to yeah. talk to them in just a sec. It's a long Bill one. Bill Winter and Anthony Becker. Yes. It's a kind of a long one, so we might want to try to keep this little intro down to a uh, manageable level. But I will not um, cut the news. Okay, no. If, if there are news. Right. Well, there are some news. Well, let's start with that then. What do we got? Well, <clears throat> so um, probably everybody remembers that we had a couple of interviews with um, 3D Realms and um, Interceptor people, Frederick Schreiber and um, Mike Nielsen. Mm -hmm. And they are also known for Bombshell and stuff. Right. And um, the Red Rogers game, the successor of Commander Keen, actually was sold to THQ Nordic uh, two years ago. Now they announced that on the 22nd of February, you can buy Red Rogers on the Switch. So it can be pre-ordered from Amazon, from Cool Shop, and a lot of other places already. It's um, at about the 26, 30 euro price range. So it's not one of the most expensive Switch games. And um, I would say you get a very good value for the money. Another news is also that um, there will be a successor of Doom, Doom Eternal, and it will also be on the on the Switch. Okay. Which is quite nice because the first Switch um, version of the first Doom was actually pretty good. I mean, you know, Bethesda um, with its software made a new Doom, mm -hmm. and that was released um, two years ago when the Switch was released. And and the uh, Switch version is pretty good, actually. Of course, the graphics are a bit scaled down, but it's fluent and uh, you can play it well. So it will be, it will be interesting to see um, how the next Doom will be on the Switch. Okay. And... And um, there's actually a third news, and that is um, Mortal Kombat 6 is going to be released, oh, okay. also on the Switch. And that's surprising, because Mortal Kombat 5 was already so realistic, and I bought it too, that you can see a lot of videos on YouTube of people puking while they play the game, because... <laughs> In their mind, it's so realistic when they get, when they get, well, you know, the fatality moves at the end. Dang, I gotta check that out because that's pretty mm. awesome. I, I, I'm not sure you want to watch that. How people puke in front of camera? No, no, I don't want to see the puking thing. I just want to see the realism of the, uh, of the uh, fatalities. Oh, okay, so the, there are some previews of the game, and they look pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And it is graphically wise a lot better than Mortal Kombat 5. So it will be interesting to see how they want to make it possible on the Switch because the general opinion right now is the game is graphically so advanced it's impossible to do it on the Switch. Well, you can always uh, kind of downgrade it and, and turn it more into the... Because if it's already so realistic, then you know probably doesn't hurt to kick it back a generation or two to where it's slightly less realistic. But yeah. uh, the gameplay is still awesome. But we'll see. We'll see how it works. Well, I've got some. Okay. Um, we, we've we talked to... Well, well, RGCD is one of the big uh, retro publishers. I don't even know if you'd call it a retro publisher, but they're a big publisher for are, yes. the 64 and Amiga and whatnot. And they have recently released... And this is at the end of January. They have um, announced that they're launching Tiger Claw and Power Glove Reloaded for the Amiga. Nice. So those are those are ports of Tiger Claw and Power Glove, which was apparently a C64 game, um, and it is yeah, featuring uh, better graphics and sound and gameplay and whatnot, and there's going to be 
physical editions of both of these games with discs and manuals and buttons and stickers and all the stuff that you would normally get with that. Nice. Um, and and the uh, a CD that that has the C64 Windows Mac and Linux versions as well. Nice. So that's that's nifty to see some new stuff. You know, 2018 was sort of a banner year for for new games on the 64 and Amiga and 2019 is is already kicking off to a pretty good start as well from what it looks like. And it's interesting how the Switch is now um turning since last year into a retro platform for retro games, indie games, and successor of former retro IPs. Yeah. There was also, yeah. um, as of January 30th, um, evidently photos and video of the fully um, fully assembled ZX Spectrum Next uh, was released, um, showing that it's an actual real thing. I think it's different. It's not the same thing as the, the Vega, because, <laughs> you know, that was a... Disaster, but um, the Spectrum Next is a real thing. There's actual footage of it existing and and being there. So that's that's nifty if you're into that sort of thing. And also, <clears throat> did you see the news about this? Is probably again in January um, that a prototype C65 for schools was discovered in somebody's drawer. Yes, yes, that. That amazes me. That still, it's 2019, and we're still finding stuff like that. And and so this is a C65 that you know, obviously the C65 was never released, and it was it only existed in prototype stages. But this is a chopped down version, so it's it doesn't have the floppy drive built in. It's just a keyboard, and I think it's missing some of the ports. the the mm. The main board seems to be much smaller, and doesn't have all the expansion options because it was meant to be in schools, I guess. But considering the fact that the C65 was sort of like a dead end project to begin with, it's really it sh kind of shocks me that they went through the process of like having the plastic molds made to make this prototype of the educated uh, education version. I'm not seeing where that that new one was found. Oh, we'll we'll put a link to it in here so that people can can hit it up. Um. Evidently, it was revealed by Fred Bowen, who is one of the, the, the designers, the software guys at, at Commodore, or was one of the software guys at Commodore. Um, little is known of it at this point, but externally, it's a C65 with the drive section chopped off. On the back, there's a DB25 female that could be a serial port, and a DB15 that could be RGB output, maybe Ethernet. Uh, on the side of the same ports is a 65, power, two joysticks, and a reset. Um, there's two big sockets on the main board for custom chips, and we don't know what they are exactly. There is no smaller square socket for the floppy drive controller chip, since because, because there's no drive. There's an expansion port that looks the same as the 65s, but there's no cutout for it. No internal trapdoor expansion. So it's it's really a, a chopped down little uh, little version of it. That was that's literally like the picture of it is in a drawer in someone's living room. And so you got to wonder, like, here's one. I would, there, had, had, there had to have been more than one of these things that existed. And where are they? Nice. I have dreams about, like, walking into, like, a random empty building and discovering it was, like, a Commodore warehouse and finding these things in a back room somewhere. But I don't know if that'll ever happen. If that's, if that's a thing that could happen. You, you know... Um... There are a lot of things about Commodore, even people working at Commodore <laughs> didn't know. Yeah, right. So I actually found I that, that. Um, EA did two announcements. One one is making um, expansion packs for already released Red Alert mm -hmm. and uh, Tiberian Sun, it seems. No, Tiberian Dawn. And there will be a spin-off of a Command and Conquer game this um, year, it hmm. seems. Interesting. A spin-off. Yeah. Conquer and Command. Or was that... Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, that spin-off was <coughs> old. <coughs> oh. Old news. Okay, so pretend, pretend we didn't say that. Okay, yeah. So, um, remastering. 
Yeah, lost for the 25th okay. anniversary in 2020. Yeah. So that's pretty nifty. Yeah, but but honestly, why not making a successor? Because, I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, well, because there's no, you know, you see it in TV and you see it in movies and you see it in, there's, nobody's going for new stuff anymore. It's like, let's let's squeeze as much as we can out of what already exists. So, here's a game that's been, it's 25 years in 2020. Let's just remaster it and sell it again rather than make something new well i second i i, I don't think i would second that because um Gilmore and conquer was always a success right it was one of the biggest franchises right right but and, and that's the thing like you can you can say that if we if we take this huge success and we remaster it we'll probably sell quite a few however if we make and a new game a it might not yeah mm. It mm. might not sell as much. It might not be that good of a game, you know. But this one, we know it works and we know it's popular. So mm. just squeeze some more money out of this rock. Yeah. It was one of my first um, CD games mm -hmm. back in 96. It was released in 95 and I got it in 96 for the PC, for DOS. And um, it was one of the best things ever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I forgot the name. Of the game that was actually getting a successor uh, last year. Hmm. Um, it was a robot game, strategy game, oh, I... round based. What was it again? Something with Earth. Always forget it. I have no idea. Despite, despite I played recently. Um, let, let's have a look in my Steam account. Um, Battletech. Battletech. Yeah, Battletech is one of such franchises that is, like, very old. And um, recently, like, last year, they made a successor of it. And I have to admit, um, it's awesome. And I actually found out in the news recently that it actually was voted as best PC games of 2018. Really? Yeah. Fascinating. Let's see. It was um, mentioned among the best games of 2018 by the portal Rock Paper Shotgun. Okay. And I have to admit, it's awesome. I like it a lot. I mean, Battletech is one of such things that is around since the <clears throat> 80s. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> I do, I do. I, I believe that I had that on something, and I wasn't fond of it. What, what, on whatever I had it on. Well, it's a round-based strategy game. Yeah. And I have the original for the uh, C64. Okay. That's probably what I had it on, the 64. Because that's what I had. It was released in 1988. Yes. Hey, the new Kingdom Hearts is out. Kingdom Hearts? Can yeah. you put me in the picture? What was it again? Kingdom Hearts was a... Weird mashup between um, between Final Fantasy and Disney. Ah, ah, right. So like you're playing this game, and you're like your party members are freaking Donald Duck and Goofy and and stuff, and it's it's real bizarre, but it's actually a well put together game. And the last one was out in 2005, and people have been waiting for the third to come out. In for all that time, and they finally just now released Kingdom Hearts Three. Yeah, I saw I saw the promotion video trailer on YouTube just yesterday, and I couldn't quite catch what it was about. But hey, it's it, you you end up going from world to world, and it's all different Disney movie worlds, <clears> which <throat> is kind of bizarre. And I need to clean this. Nice. Up. Hang on. Why? What's what's wrong? <laughs> Something spilled, and I was watching it creep towards the carpet. So yeah, there's quite a bit happening. Nice. According to People Magazine, um, scientists say they can recreate dinosaurs within the next five years. Really? Yes. That's creepy. This is according to Jack Horner, who is the who is a world-renowned um, paleontologist. Mm. Um. 
they're not going to be doing it the way that they did it in Jurassic Park. It's going to yeah, just be, good. it's just going to, well, but it's just going to be taking current birds and fiddling with their DNA to make them look Ooh. more like dinosaurs. Ooh. Okay. So we pretty much know how this is going to end. Hopefully, I, I'm not in the near to that. <laughs> yeah, we'll so, so what's, what's your opinion, actually, about um, the Switch turning into a retro gaming platform um, and um, indie games platform? Um, I mean, if you consider that <laughs> two years ago, nobody was publishing of the third parties because the hardware was set to be too weak. But that's that's almost a that that's almost a um, a theme with Nintendo things is that the hardware is yeah. always a little bit behind because I remember the GameCube was a bit behind and then the Wii was a bit behind and their their the Game focus... Boy was a bit behind because yeah, it, it wasn't was. in color. Yeah, I, I think that for for the rep... NES wasn't behind. That's and the Super Nintendo neither. I guess right. those two systems were exceptions. Yeah. In the Nintendo history. Right, right. Um, well, uh, eh. when did the NES come out? Um, in in Japan, um, Famicom, 83, and in USA, 85. Okay. You look like you lost what you wanted to say. No, no, I was just thinking about what the NES... The NES was basically a 6502-based machine. Um, similar to the C sixty four in similar. capability, yeah, yeah, similar as far as as yeah, it, it, it was a, a Rico processor, but it had a sixty five hundred two core. So in yeah. in eighty five, that was I, I guess that was still um, still technically current. Although by eighty five, you know, there were sixteen bit machines out. The sixty eight thousand was you know the Amiga was a thing, and the ST was a thing. So, <clears throat> but um, but in, in concern of uh, video games, you mostly well, had Sega with a Master System. The um, the Mega Drive wouldn't come out until 1988, 89, and ninety right. in in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. So. And, and and the the master system was a was a Z eighty a Z eighty, yeah. Um, at, at four megahertz, what was the Nintendo? Um, it doesn't say how fast it was. Either way, um, I, so in, in in that respect, anyway, um, I feel like the Switch would probably be a good platform for retro gaming because it, you don't need the the most hardcore specs to do that sort of thing and, and for for retro themed games there's like there's a lot of games that have the the pixely graphics and kind of try to emulate that that style that that, that existed in, back in the 80s and early 90s i, I suppose um but then you're saying it's, it's been big for indie games as well yeah that's that true. that surprises me because normally nintendo is pretty has that that iron claw grip on what gets released. You know, they don't want you releasing your independent games. They want you to go through them, kind of. You know, do you remember with the NES, everything had to have the Nintendo seal of approval? You know, unless it was, you know, you you had one of those, the the rare unapproved games that were usually in weird colored cases and stuff. And I can't think of any SNES games that, yeah. The seal of approval is still on the games. Right, okay, so... And that's a Switch game. Yeah. And it's not like... I, I guess there's no real... I, I wonder what the qualifications are to get the seal of approval. Because there are some dogs that made it onto the NES. And you, you gotta wonder, like, like who at Nintendo was looking at these and being like, Oh yeah, this is good. Mm. Or maybe well, they you, just you always to... You always had bad games on the um, older systems as well. I mean, for example, the first version of... Road trash is really trash, uh-huh. you know. 
Well, there's lots of games that are just garbage huh? that that, uh, that came out, and they all had the seal. So I'm just I wonder yeah. what the actual. It was kids friendly. <sighs> but then is, Mortal is that, Kombat is that what it was. Yeah, uh, but then Mortal Kombat wasn't kids friendly, because even on the Game Boy it had um, mortality moves. Hmm. Okay, so it was approval of acceptable content in the manufacturing of official NES game packs. Um, basically, that you weren't doing anything weird, like like Tengen, I guess, could. Which was a Terry. Right. Yeah. Could. Um, they were able to circumvent lockout chips on, on, unlicensed games. So basically, you just need to have a license. And then, otherwise, the chips on there would lock you out. I don't know how this works. It's actually interesting because that is what <clears throat> that is what Activision did with Atari. Yeah. And then Atari did the same with Nintendo. Yeah. So I guess probably Isn't you, that you just crazy? have to yeah. you just have to pay Nintendo some money to use the seal, and then you were a an official thing, probably. So it didn't mean anything for quality of the game no it's just it just has it just assures you that the product has been evaluated for use with the system and and as a kid as a customer my parents and i we all thought like wow this must be a good game yeah yeah that's what uh, i think that's what most of us thought and then you get some some of these real crappy things and be like wait a minute this is terrible and you know um homebrew things not for the Switch, but for older systems, often have a seal of approval. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A seal of approval mm -hmm. on it. Well, do we have anything else? No. But I have to close this um, gaming page because... I'm getting noise from it, from the advertisement from it. You know what I hate? With the, every damn page I open now, like, throws a thing up there, like, subscribe for updates, or let us go and add to your, your uh, announcements, or some nonsense. And it's like, I just want to read the stupid article. I don't need you to black out the page and pop up a little thing there that I have to X out of again. Mm -hmm. Or or when you're just looking for something, you just want an information, like, like you know, how do I set the clock in my car? Or... Or just give me a quick recipe for how to cook something in the oven. And you go there and there's like an eight paragraph dissertation on like the history of the car manufacturer and all this other stuff before you can actually get to like push the left button. This is how you cook? Push the left button? Well, if I'm setting the clock in my car. Okay. Or or with cooking, you know, again, it's like, all right, how do I cook this in the oven? And it's like, okay, well, the actual instructions are put it in the oven at 350, 350 degrees for, you know, 20 minutes. That's all I need. I don't need to read a freaking book about, like, the history of, like, your family's recipe and, and how ovens work and all this other nonsense leading up to just this information. Just give me the information. <laughs> information overload. Yeah. Everyone has to write a freaking article. And I guess that there's some, there's some kind of – it has something to do with, 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 uh, with search results. And, and the more words you write or something, the more uh, – the, the quicker it will turn up in searches. But – I don't care. I just want to know what the answer is. I don't need to read a thing about it. Anyway, the Guru Meditation is over there. You can't see where I'm pointing because this is an audio podcast. But nice. They're sitting. They're sitting right over there, waiting quietly. So nice. Yeah. As if. Yes. Before Yerk starts coughing again, let's uh, let's let's cut over to them. <laughs> So we are here with the Guru Meditation, Bill Winter and Anthony Becker. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. What's up, AJ? What's up, Jörg? Great to be here. Finally. Yeah, yeah. that's it's awesome, man. To interview. So. I've been a big fan of yours. I met AJ, you know, at Vintage Computer Festival East, and uh, I think it's just so rad that you guys are still doing a disc magazine, you know, in 2019 now. It's just it's awesome. And now that you've expanded to Amiga, you guys are rank even higher on my uh my my, <laughs> my list it's just awesome work you guys are doing i know well it's all thanks to the big team we have you know like 19 people and it's um, you can be um, very much creative with with so much people but you are very creative with just two people so you know really it's mostly one i just show up and say a bunch of stuff and then go home <laughs> okay 
That's that's pretty much my job. <laughs> yeah, no, we're we're a good team because I uh, I have you know the video production skills. Uh, that's what I do for a living, and Anthony has got the computer skills. He's an IT professional, and also a, a, he's a Commodore historian, basically. I mean, I've never met anyone that knows more about Commodore than you know him except for maybe that people actually work there <laughs> he yes. knows you know so much about it and you know I, I love amiga don't get me wrong it's been a huge part of my life but i'm not like an expert you know I, i'm an amiga user i use amiga to create artwork to create graphics that's that's what i really use amiga for and you know i like to play some of the new games as well but uh i mean anthony is just like super knowledgeable about all aspects of amiga so the two of us together you know make a great team so how did it all start Oh, man. Well, Anthony and I met way back in 1989. Uh, we met at the Westchester Amiga User Group. We, Anthony and I are both from, you know, the same, same town, essentially. And uh, there was a computer store called Software Link in uh, White Plains, New York. It's about 30 miles north of uh, New York City. And there was this user group that met, you know, every month on the first Thursday of every month. And it was, it was amazing. This is like pre-internet. The only thing back then were BBSs. Um, so yeah, and magazines. Where you could, only place you could really get any information. So um, there was this group that met in the local Commodore store called Software Link, and uh, it was and an Amiga user group. Under the local <laughs> Commodore store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, met, it was underground, literally. It was an underground group. <laughs> it met in the basement of this uh, this Commodore store. Yeah. And it was just awesome because, you know, it was a great way to, to get together with people and, and meet other Amiga users. And you would see, like, what the, the latest software was, what new games that came out. People would demo all different projects that they were doing. And uh, it was just, it was great getting together and just meeting other folks. And you can keep in touch with them throughout the month. And, uh, you know, I made so many friends in that club. I made some of the best friends I've ever had in my life in that club. I still still keep in touch with them today, including Anthony, of course. <laughs> and, you know, it was just an amazing uh it was an amazing resource because if you had questions, if something wasn't working right, chances are there'd be someone at the meeting that could help you out. Or even just to, to see what other people were doing. You know, it was, you know, you had this machine, you had some magazines, you bought some software along with it, but it's like every time you'd go, uh, well, I, I always tell the story. It's like you would, you would go into the store, you would go down the stairs into this dark room. It's just all these people milling about and like the meeting starts and you'd, You'd always see somebody doing something that you were like, oh, I didn't even know I could do that with this machine. Oh, that's mm. cool. You know, it was just with every meeting, every every show in New York would always broaden, you know, your mind on on what the Amiga could do. Yeah, one of the meetings I remember most fondly is our uh, video toaster meeting. It was the first time we'd ever seen a toaster. We were really lucky to get a toaster. It was still an alpha at the time of our demo. And, you know, when when the guy from uh, New Tech brought it to demo it, it was just like, oh, my God, this is this is a game changer. This is this is going to be something that changes video production forever. And it, and it was and it was so cool to get a sneak peek at it. Mm. Nice. This is like, you know, pre-internet days when you can't just go on YouTube and find, you know, the, whatever things people are doing. I guess that's sort of supplanted it. Uh, well, yeah, I, I would. On. Yeah, I'd say unfortunately the internet's done two things. It's brought us closer together because, you know, pro I wouldn't be talking probably to you two right now since I'm down here in sunny Florida. Sorry to make you envious. Oh. Um, but it's also kind of made us further apart because you don't have as many clubs and things. It's just people don't feel the need for it. It doesn't have to fill that space, but. Now, I figure things always go in cycles. I think at some point it'll all come back around and, and people will be forming these groups again just because you want that sort of that more personal than just doing a Google search and watching a video kind of thing. Right. Well, one note about that is just, just so you know, WOG, Westchester Media User Group, has been meeting on the first Thursday of every month ever since, you know, 1987. We never stopped meeting, and we never will. <laughs> we're still going, man. We had our January 2019 meeting last week, and uh, we're still we're still going strong. And actually, we've seen a bit of a resurgence. You know, there was there was the dark ages, man, in like the you know early 2000s when it was just like me, Anthony, and two other guys meeting. You know, there wasn't that much stuff going on in the Amiga in the Amiga scene. And it was really just like a couple of friends getting together. As a, it was an excuse to see your good friends, you know, every month. But now, you know, thanks to the Internet, thanks to Guru Meditation YouTube channel, uh, it's drawn, you know, new users, new new members to the club. So we actually have about 30 active people in the club now. 
And we get about seven to 15 members at each meeting, depending, you know, on the, the time of year and who's around that month. So we never stop, man. We never will. We'll, we'll keep it going as, as long as we can. That's nice. pretty amazing. 30 people, because I mean, I, I don't know about I, I imagine we're probably about the same the same age. I don't remember ever seeing an Amiga until I think the first time I saw an Amiga was at um, the Vintage Computer Festival. Oh, wow. When, yeah. The, the, the first one that I went to, uh, you, the ones you had set up were the first time I ever actually saw one in person. That's awesome. I mean, that's the whole reason why Anthony and I do this. You know, Anthony and I just want to we love Amiga so much and we just want to preserve the history of the Amiga. So most of our videos online on YouTube are just about like, you know, an old piece of software that we used to use or an old piece of hardware that we used to use. We just want to like document this stuff. So people who are want to learn about it, you know, have it as a resource, you know, and people hopefully in the future, if YouTube's still around, <laughs> can yeah. still, can, like, it will be like an archive of, of information. And, but, you know, but there's nothing, uh, there's nothing like bringing actual Amigas to a vintage computer festival and letting people, you know, get hands-on experience with it. You know, they could actually like see the CRT, they can see the real Amiga, and they can experience it like we did. You know, back back in the heyday, back in the in the late 80s and early 90s. There's no, we love it. You know, it's so cool. It's really amazing because there's people that come to our uh, exhibits and to our YouTube channel that are, you know, they're old time Amiga guys, and they're like, oh my god, I remember this. This is so cool. And there's other people like you, AJ, who have just never experienced it before and are experiencing it for the first time. And that's something like I never really expected or anticipated. But you're not alone. A lot of people are are in the same boat as you. Right. You don't kind of think that you could in- introduce people to a 30 year old computer and they'd actually take an interest in it. And this is like a kind of a throwaway society. You got people standing online every single year to get a new phone. You know, you got to get a new phone every year, and this is a 30-year-old computer, and, you know, uh, it is people see it and become interested in it is, is I think, pretty amazing. It's kind of that that bastion of, of sanity, in my opinion, in, in what's become kind of a bit of an insane world. <laughs> you know, things just move so fast, and it's nice to, to kick back with something that it's just like being, you know, a teenager or a, or a 20 year old again. And, you know, you, your whole life ahead of you, the world's ahead of you and you can just sit and throw a disc in the machine and and, mm. uh, and do some stuff. Well, to me, you look like 25. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I felt 25. <laughs> I got every joint in me cracks. I get up. I sound like castanets. <laughs> <laughs> But I can relate very much to um, preserving history. That's actually the reason why I do all these um, YouTube interviews with pioneers and inventors, you know, to preserve the history. So um, there's something yeah. to be said for the the simpler, older hardware, because like you like you said, we're buying every, every year we buy a new phone or you know the new laptop comes out every every couple of years. So you got to upgrade. I had. My main machine was a C64, and I had that thing for like like 10 years, and never upgraded until finally going to you know until it broke essentially, and I had to, you know. And people I think forget that a lot of these machines were perfectly serviceable and really still are for a lot of tasks. Well, you know that that yeah. you know like I've got an, I've got an Amiga 500 now, and you can do you know basic text editing, and and you can do a lot of stuff on it that that your general current laptop would would handle now well, but i heard think, oh, i heard oh, T- tls encryption is a problem because it needs it needs so much um cpu power i don't yeah. know about I, that is at least what i heard mm-hmm. oh yeah i, I kind of lived through the years where you could still do a lot of like web on the amiga and i was actually still i mean long into it i was still using an amiga 1200 to you know eyebrows a web voyager going on the web and you kind of saw slowly the fact that these browsers and things didn't couldn't keep either didn't keep up because they didn't have the teams didn't have the development or couldn't keep up because the, the motorola processors just were too slow too little memory you know you kind of saw it getting away from that but i mean it's yeah, I'm the same, you know, I say the same thing pretty much. I mean, I used these machines. I mean, I had the 2000 for the longest time. I used my 1200 
and a 4,000 kind of side by side for the longest time. And now you got to think, I mean, if you're throwing a phone away after a year, it's like that thing's got to still be good. Right. Like, like it's, it's like we could, we could sit and you could, you could, you could actually form a connection with the thing because you could open it up. You'd be throwing hardware in there, new boards, new, this, a new operating system, upgrading this. It like became almost personal to you each, each machine. And I see that in a lot of the machines I get from people. Uh-huh. is you open it up and you see the boards they had in there. Oh, this guy had a 386 bridge board and he had a Mac emulator. You know, you could almost see what that person was up to, what that person was doing. It's a very personal thing as opposed to a phone that it's the same brick. It doesn't, you know, unless uh-huh. someone put a sticker on it, you're not. it's not going to look any different from anybody else's phone. All right. All right. I think somebody's sitting on the table or something because we have some disturbance noise. I don't know if you are doing something, Anthony. I think I, I think I accidentally smacked the bottom of the desk with my hand. I talk yeah, because, with, I'm, I'm, because I'm half Italian. I talk <laughs> with my hands. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. Up in the up in the camera with them. Okay. So no I'll problem. try to I'm trying to keep them out of the way, and it sometimes bites me. So I'm gonna keep them. <laughs> okay. I'll try to keep them still, but I can't promise nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Just nothing I noticed. Um, but but how did you actually start, guys, with the with the computers? I mean, um, how you met, we know now, but but it I guess it started way before that. I wouldn't say. I mean, not that way before that. I mean, I got a Commodore sixty four uh, from my parents, and it was uh, they were going to buy me a computer, and um, this was uh, this was this had to be like just before high school, and. Uh, you know, so I was looking at every machine. I was looking at the Atari 800. I was looking at the VIC-20. I was looking at every machine, just looking at what they had and what their features were and what their price was, because my parents were only going to spend so much money. You know, my parents, you know, wouldn't just throw money around. And I think I was walking up the stairs to go to up to my room one day, and the stairs were right next to the living room, and there was a commercial on TV. And I mean, then this I mean, we all know later Commodore wasn't very good at advertising the Amiga, but this shows the power of of advertising. Is it was a Commodore 64 commercial? It was when they had just lowered the price on it, and I, I stopped on the stairs. I was staring at the TV, like, oh, you know, color, sound, full keyboard. Oh, I gotta go. I gotta go find out more about this machine. So you know, you buy Compute Magazine. It was a you know, had everything, had every computer in it, so you could really get side by sides, and uh, and I picked the 64, and uh, and I picked it up. Well, my parents picked it up, and I didn't put it down. Um, I used that thing till it died. I got the 128 after that um, to replace it, because that was kind of I had. And, and again, it's like when you got something, you didn't really. Like there's all this Atari Commodore war nowadays, um, and back then, I never saw that. In war, I think it's I think it's kind of just a cheeky thing now. We like to poke fun at each other, but we all kind of like the same stuff. Um, but back then, it's like you, you if you got a computer, all your friends chances are they got the same thing, so you'd all be able to go to each other's house and you know and have you know and swap stuff and swap what you're doing and everything so i didn't really know anybody who had an atari who had a a ti or or an apple or anything until much later like when i went to college and so when i was in college i ran into the friend of mine who had a 64 when i did and i was over his house all the time he was over my house all the time we kind of drifted apart during high school he went to work i went to college and I see him working at a store that sells the Amiga 1000, and he had, he had one. And he's like, "You got to come to my house. You got to see this new machine." And you know, even though I'm getting Commodore magazines, I'm flipping right past the Amiga stuff because I'm I have a Commodore 128. It it just wasn't something I had. It was an expensive machine. He's like, "No, the new machines are coming out. It's going to be a lot cheaper. It's going to be a better machine." You, you know. And I went to um, I went to Amiga Expo was the might have been this close to the following weekend. It might have been two weeks later. There was an AMI Expo in New York. And I, he's like, you should come to the show and see. And I went to the show, and I was just I was just floored. I mean, they had this guy, the person draw a circle on the screen. And then the guy's like, well, that's not a circle. It's a sphere. And he, you know, hits a few things. He hits a few menus, does, you know, ray tracing. And, and it's, a, it's a, a reflective sphere. And I'm like, 
Oh, my Lord. There's an affordable machine that can do this stuff? That's just, yeah, I got it. And then, and then you know, my parents are giving me money for food. I was really thin back then because <laughs> that money did not go for food. That money went under the mattress, and, and that went to my 500. <laughs> my story is uh, a little bit different. You know, um, it's 100% got into computers because of my dad. You know, in 1980, I was five years old and my dad brought home an Atari 800 computer. I didn't know what a computer was. Uh, my dad, you know, he's not like a computer genius by any stretch of the imagination, but he likes tech and he wanted to, he was very excited about uh, the new home computers coming out and he wanted to share it with me. So uh, he brought home this Atari 800 and I was like, what What the heck is this thing, you know? And uh, I was I was fascinated by it. And then we started to load up a couple of games he loaded up like star raiders for me and it had uh, some other like really cool uh, like applications about doing you know like science experiments it was some sort of uh application slash game that let you like mix chemicals together virtually it was really really cool and uh man i just i love that atari 100 it just it just got me hooked i was like man these computers are are, are just awesome and i just started my imagination started to like run away with me you know and uh, he he got a 300 baud modem for me with acoustic coupler, so I would like dial into the local BBSs, and uh, we had a cassette tape drive. You know, the 800 came with uh, cartridges, and then eventually we upgraded to a floppy drive, which was a game changer because the games would load so much faster from the floppy disk than the tape drive, and that's where it all started with the 800. I, it was a very magical machine for me. So yeah, so as far as like the Hating Ataris, that's certainly not me. I, I love the Ataris, especially the 8-bits, because the 800 was my, my first machine. And then that just got me hooked into, into the hobby. Um, my dad also brought home like an Apple IIe from, uh, from school. He's a teacher. He teaches television and radio production. So his school had a bunch of like, Apple computers. So he brought home the IIe. And I got a 2400 baud modem with that one. I would dial into CompuServe and these other like online services. I loved, I loved going online. Um, and then eventually uh, he bought me a, a Commodore 64 and loved it 64 as well. Uh, and I'm just like super lucky and thankful that my dad, you know, was so supportive. And he didn't really use the computers that much. Like he did use them. He used them to keep track of his collections. He was a big record collector being a radio engineer. Uh, so he'd use lots of uh, database programs to keep track of his records and all his different collections. He's got a train collection. So um, he would keep track of all that stuff. And um so he's always, you know, been super supportive, and that's how how I got into it. But then, you know, of course, I love games as well. They're nice. Um, they're super fun. When you're a kid, you love games. I still love games now. And I would, back then, you know, you would get get a game, and it would come in like a box, and on the back of the box, it would show screenshots of the game on all different platforms. So it would have like Atari 800 screenshot, you know, the Commodore 64 screenshot, and then, you know, in 1985, they started having the screenshot for the Amiga. And I was just like, oh, my God, like, what is this? What is this Amiga thing? I mean, look at the screenshot. The game looks so much better on the Amiga than it does on my Atari 800 or my Commodore 64. <laughs> you know, I want to know more about this Amiga. And I started to read about it. And I was like, oh, wow, this this computer just sounds absolutely awesome. But the 1000, you know, was pretty pricey. Uh, and then in 1987, the Amiga 500 came out and it was much more reasonably priced. And my dad's like, you know what? We got to go check out one of these Amiga 500s. So we went to Software Link, the store in White Plains where Westchester Amiga user group meets. And uh, there was, you know, the Amiga 500 sitting there. Uh, I think they had Defender the Crown up on it. And I was just floored. I was like, oh, my God, this is this is awesome. Because I'm a visual guy. So I, I responded, like, immediately to the incredible graphics that it had. And my dad was like, oh, my God, this, this computer is so cool. Like, we got we to gotta get one of these Amiga 500s. <laughs> so I was lucky enough. And in, you know, 1987, under the Christmas tree was a nice Amiga 500 for me. And, uh, and yeah, and that's when I joined the Westchester Amiga user group. Uh, actually, back then it was called Amuse, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about it, I have Dust Bunker. His father has Dust Basement, Dust Garage, and Dust Barn. <laughs> 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 yeah, my dad's got a lot of collections. He's really big into record collecting as well, because like I said, he was uh, an audio engineer for a radio Records, station here in New York. Movies, yeah, trains. Got, and he uh, keeps... Yeah, he keeps it all cataloged, you know, on his database, <laughs> and he goes to all these different conventions. He's got a big three-ring binder filled with all of his, his, uh, you know, everything he's, he owns. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's all because of my dad, because he bought me that first computer. But the computer just, um, it, I just like so many different aspects of it. You know, like I said, I love playing games, but at, at the end of the day, I just I love what I can create with it because I'm a creative person. So I I always use the computer like as a as a tool 
to uh, to to create things. That's my that's my real real passion. Using them as a tool to create things. Even though I still I love I'm very interested in the way they work and just by the nature of owning a computer and trying to figure out how to do things. I've I've learned about operating systems. I've learned about the hardware. But the, at the end of the day, the, the main thing is, you know, it's a tool for me to, uh, to to express myself and be creative. And when your Amigas crashed, you founded Guru Meditation. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when the the the, uh, the guys who made Amiga have a good sense of humor, when uh, when you when you crash an Amiga, all of a sudden the power light starts to flash and like, you know, it's coming. Your heart skips a beat because if you didn't save your work, you're you're oh, in you're in you're dread. in a lot of trouble. Yeah, it was the dreadful. Dread. So the power light would start to flash and then all of a sudden the screen would go black and you're like, oh, no. And then there were this there would be this uh, this sign that popped up. It was a black screen with red lettering and this red rectangle at the top of the screen. It would say uh, software failure, press left mouse button to continue. Then it would say guru meditation number, and it would give you a number that indicated like why the machine crashed. And it, it was a notorious, it still is, an infamous <laughs> message. Well, it, was, um, it was a number that meant absolutely nothing to you. The only thing right. that you cared about was that like you just lost whatever it was and we hated that message back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now it, we did hate that message back then. But, you know, time passes on. And uh, when Anthony and I started the, the YouTube channel, we were just kind of thinking, like, you know, what, what should we call ourselves? And we're silly guys. Like, we don't take ourselves very seriously. And the truth is, like, half the time when we try something, it doesn't work anyway. So we're like, oh, we're just always guru meditating. So we're the, yeah. we're the guru meditation. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, we had that incident recently with trying to do uh, an episode on the chroma key and the chroma key just would not behave. <laughs> so we had it. We had a complete guru meditation day. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, it was really frustrating. Um, before Anthony went down to Florida, we, uh, we were banking some episodes, and the chroma key was a device for the Amiga that I still use a lot. I loved it. You know, it was uh, allowed you to superimpose yourself uh, over video, or any you know, um, or um, you could like you know put Amiga graphics underneath video, just like today, like when you have a blue screen or a green screen. Back then, it was just a blue chroma screen key. for the chroma yeah. key. Yeah. So um, we wanted to do an episode about it. I still have my chroma key and. Man, we loaded in all of our gear, which takes a long time. We loaded it into a TV studio, had it all set up, and unfortunately, the chroma key just just didn't work. <laughs> it couldn't get yeah. it to work. We tried really hard. We got it to reality, almost work. Yeah. I'm on a green screen right now because none of that actually exists. <laughs> oh, nice. Ignore but, uh, the ignore the stuff behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> so so instead, we just uh, packed all the stuff up and went to the bar. Which <laughs> yeah, we hit the bar that day. Yeah. yeah, we hit it hard. But you know, and that the truth of the matter is, like, we love doing the YouTube channel and all, and it's it's great to preserve all the history, which is our primary goal. But the real reason why we do it is just because it's an excuse to for friends to get together. Like you know, like Andy and I just love hanging out, and we always have a blast shooting these episodes. And that's that's what it really comes down to. It's just an excuse to like hang out with uh with my best bud. I think the most hysterical thing for me was on because uh, once we shoot the the episode, I, you know, Bill goes off to edit it. I'm not that involved in that part because I I would know what I was doing in the first place, and and that many hands probably spoil the pie. Um, so what I end up seeing is I, I end up seeing the episode like like everyone else. I see it when it gets posted, and I think it was the first one where I'm watching it, and then suddenly at the end is the is the outtakes, and I'm like, I can't believe you put that in there, <laughs> and I'm la I'm laughing at myself because I'm like, oh, I can't believe I said that, <laughs> you know. That was just, and that's us. I mean, that's the whole time we're doing it is where we're laughing, joking around, having a great time. It's two friends hanging out together, so it's. Yeah, really, it's it's an it's just really an excuse, um, and I think a, a, a decent excuse because we're serving two purposes because we're doing something we like to do, and we're having an excuse to do it because we, I mean, we've each had these machines for a long time, and I'm tapping the table again. Let's stop it. <laughs> we uh, we had these machines a long time, and and you know you kind of stop using them, you stop getting them out as much because you have other things to do. You have girlfriends, wives, jobs you know, more family things going on. So you have a lot less time for it. So it kind of gets pushed to the side. So it's like, OK, let's get this stuff out. Let's go look through our stuff and, you know, come up with an idea. And OK, let's shoot that. You know, so it's just it's just a reason, a reason to, to still have them, because when you have something, you don't use it. Uh, honestly, what's the point in having it? Well said. Well said. 
so so you guys still do you use your your amigas outside of just sort of demoing them and 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 testing things out like like do you use them for any creative purpose or anything oh yeah i mean demoing them is is like my my primary thing that i do with it Mm -hmm. so we exhibit each year at vcf east which is a vintage computer festival east that happens uh once a year usually in the spring in wall township new jersey it's a great show that's our local show and we uh we exhibit we're like the me guys we exhibit there mm-hmm. um but now I've, I've also in addition to guru i uh, i also stream on twitch uh, and i have like a i've got a, it's become a show i never anticipated becoming a show <laughs> but it's become it's become like a weekly show where I just kind of show, um, I do something with the Amiga. And there's been so many new games and so many new things coming out for the Amiga. Like, mm-hmm. literally every week, there's something new to demo. So I enjoy I enjoy uh, busting out my 1200 or my 500 and uh, showing the folks, like, what's new in the Amiga community and, like, what, what new game has come out this week. So uh, I do it. That's become, like, a big, a big part of what I do as well. Um, so I, I use it for that and, um, I still, I still like, I'm really enjoying going back and, and learning, relearning some of the old software. I, I would love, you know, I love using, uh, deluxe paint. I love using art department professional. And, you know, back then when I was 12, 13, 14, 15 years old using this stuff, I hadn't really developed yet. I knew like, I loved art and, but I didn't really know where, where it all, how it all worked. And then, you know, time went on and it turns out that I'm really into photography and video and now I do cinematography for, for a living. So now I like to take all of my experience and, you know, making photographs and shooting video and seeing like what I can do with the Amiga now. <laughs> so what I, I like to take all like these modern photographs that I've made and convert them to like Amiga format and, and mess around with them and use, you know, use all of the artistic skills that I've learned over the years now and see like, okay, like if I had these skills back then, like what could have I done with the Amiga? Cause back then I really, I couldn't do much. I was still trying to figure it all out. <laughs> so I, I love it. And I'm actually, uh, it's, I'm really excited because uh, this Thursday, there's this amazing place in New York city called baby castles. They're an art collective. Uh, they specialize in independent arcade, um, in, independent arcade development, but they, they're an art collective. They do all kinds of cool stuff. So I'm going to be presenting uh, with Jason Scott, from uh, from text files and archive.org and I'm going to be showing uh, deluxe paint it's all about words so I'm going to be showing how to uh, move words around the screen using your Amiga and deluxe paint so mm-hmm. it's going to be really cool and I'm super excited about it so uh, I've got some new techniques I want to try out with deluxe paint and uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes hopefully hopefully the folks will enjoy it <laughs> and see I, I was a different user of the Amiga I I, I love the art I love the ray tracing uh, I mean first first three programs first two yeah, three programs I bought when I got my 2000 was uh, I bought Turbo Silver, I bought Distant Suns, and I got I got uh, Vista Pro. And and you know I love fiddling around with. I, I mean I never did anything professional with it, but I loved popping into. And I kept I mean I kept up through like Imagine Five on Turbo Silver and and. Um, you know, I kept updating uh, Vista Pro. I love Vista Pro, just setting a camera somewhere and letting it render a landscape. I thought that was amazing. Like the, the computer can just paint you a picture out of nothing. And uh, I mean, Distant Suns, I loved just because I've always been interested in astronomy and just to be able to kind of have the, the night sky on your screen and what's going to be a visible, all that stuff. It just amazed me. But what I didn't quite realize back then, I think I realized it more looking back. So, and I, and I played a lot of video games, to be honest. That's most of what I did on the Amiga was play all the new video games. I loved playing all the awesome games. I mean, I'd play Settlers till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. Till I mean, I remember one day the sun was coming up, like the sun was peeking through the window, and I was still playing Settlers. Um, they are actually rebooting Settlers. They announced yeah. last year at Gamescom <laughs> there yeah. will be a Settler reboot. That'll be yeah. awesome because I love that game. Yeah. But um, what I, what I realized looking back was, and the other thing that that I did with the machines was just, I mean, I was in that machine every day, and it was the first machine like Commodore sixty four. I like and it's really like a Nintendo. Right. You put it on you threw a disc in you did, we ran that one thing that game that whatever. When you were done with it, you shut the machine off. You pulled that disc out. You put another disc in it. It had a one one purpose each time you used it, and you know, except for a few limited things. If you were into programming, you never really just turned on a 64 just to use the 64. 
And the Amiga, I think, was the first computer where I would just sometimes turn it on. I would never play a game or anything. I'd be loading, you know, a new JPEG data type. I'd be, you know, transferring my stuff to a new hard drive. I'd, I'd be updating the OS and throwing, you know, 3.1 on or instead of, you know, uh, up, updating a 3.0 machine. I mean, I had, I had 3.9 3 on my Amiga 2000. I had a CD-ROM burner. I mean, there were times you just turned the Amiga on just to use the machine. And mm-hmm. and I thought that was an amazing different thing. I think it was like the first time on a machine that it was like that. They had that power that you could you could you know, you actually had to maintain that that machine. And uh what got me what got me was that you know, looking at these files now, I they're almost like sometimes a little foreign to me. Like I don't quite like I remember what I used to do, but I don't quite remember exactly how I did it. And I kind of like, uh, and, and I was thinking of of, a, of an idea for something is just going back through and reteaching myself everything from the the early one dot X days all the way up through three O on a four thousand or twelve hundred. And so I got my one thousand sitting on my desk right now. Um, ready to go and i think i'm just going to be kind of relearning it from from the early machine the early os just like i I learned it back then and just relearning everything and and i'm hoping to kind of take people on that journey with me whoever wants to watch someone try to try to figure out how to do stuff on these machines yeah because we because i think sometimes we we do get sometimes a, a few questions people like how do i load this thing on there or what do i do with this and you know, especially at the shows like at a at a vcf you get a lot of questions even people who have them and like oh hey i was trying to do this how would i put a compact flash card in my machine so i'd like to right. get just videos up of of all these little things the little things like what's a startup sequence what's a user startup what do you do in there what do you look for in there what happens when you install a program and suddenly you don't get to workbench you know, what do you do right. to figure out what's wrong? Um, and I used to, I mean, that used to be second nature to me. It mm-hmm. was like I could do it in my sleep, and, and now i got to relearn those things. That that muscle memory is not quite there anymore. I've been in Windows too long. <laughs> <clears throat> but but on the other hand, uh, there are also a lot of things that are known nowadays and wasn't known back then. For example, when I was, um, when I was talking to Chris Crick, which was a sound engineer of Epix, he, they had no idea in the early 80s about the difference between NTSC and Paul on the Commodore 64, <laughs> and that is why why winter and summer games would play too slow on European machines, you know. Um, right. I I didn't know anything about PAL NTSC till when I got my 2000. It came with a 1084 monitor, and my friend was like, "Oh man, too bad it didn't come with a 1084s." I'm like, "Why? Well, it's got stereo speakers. Oh, oh, that. Yeah, okay, I can understand. Oh, and it can go into PAL mode. I'm like, what the hell's PAL mode? <laughs> He's like, oh, that's the European mode. You could be able to play the European games on it if you had a 1084s. Luckily, um, and it's it's a fun story about my 1084 monitor. Um, I was in Distant Suns, and I had just changed what it was going to display on the screen. So it's starting to redraw the night sky, and I hear a loud bang, the screen shakes, and goes dead. I think I think I had the monitor a week, and uh, and and I I was the happiest person with a dead 1084 monitor because when I went back to the shop, I'm like, can I can I give you some money for the price difference and get an S instead? <laughs> and, and I walked home with 1084s instead of a 1084. And I was I was the happiest person to have a monitor die on an Amiga. <laughs> I think my first experience with PAL was booting up a game, and for some reason the controls at the bottom of the screen were not visible. And I was like, <laughs> "What's wrong with this game? I think my Amiga's broken, or the game's broken. Like, I don't understand what's going on." <laughs> and then figured out that you know PAL's got extra extra lines, extra so horizontal you, lines. So you, there were you'd twenty. You fiddle, you so, fiddle um, with that vertical hole to try to see as much of them as you could. <laughs> oh man, yeah. And then I was like, "Wait a minute, PAL? Oh, they have something different in Europe? This is so weird." <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you know, got myself a PAL booter and uh, fixed fixed that problem on my 2000 <laughs> so that was that was cool and then my other experience with pal was like on there the first time i went to to europe i went to poland to visit my wife's family and the um 
it was we were still back when they were CRT. Everyone had like a CRT in you know, their living room. The flat screens haven't caught on yet, but the uh, the extra resolution and the 25 frames per second was just like heavenly for me because as a filmmaker, you know, like 24 frames per second is the holy grail. It just looks all cinematic. And then here we had 30 frames per second, and it just didn't never looked right. But then when I went to went to Europe, and I was like, wow, it's like 25 frames per second. It's so much closer to film, and the extra lines of resolution look so much better. I was like, oh, this is this is awesome. Why don't we have PAL? Here we have NTSC, never the same color. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, that was my first PAL experience. And and on the Amiga, they they the it doesn't work quite the same. Like with the 64, if it's not NTSC fixed, it just plays weird. It might play at the wrong speed, but it may also be jittery or have all kinds of artifacts and weird. Or not. even crash. With Amiga, a lot of mm. yeah. Amiga, it, it might crash, but it also, like you said, it'll just kind of put the bottom of the screen off the screen because there's more. Because it, it, PAL pixels are square and our pixels are, you know, rectangles for some inexplicable reason. Yeah, and there's more of them as well on PAL. So it's just like it just would just bleed off the bottom of the screen. Yeah. And you had no, no chance of seeing some really important stuff. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah, being... Your health uh, meter was down there. You, you were really hurting. <laughs> yeah. I remember being younger before I knew about PAL and TSC and looking at pictures. And I couldn't figure out why people can never draw a circle. <laughs> it would always be like like an ellipse you know they they draw like the sun or something and it's a, an ellipse i'm like what's wrong with people why they can't they do this well, oh i got they, they are I, doing it just in hell that's funny it's like this well now you know what like i said I was, i'm trying to use my amiga for more modern applications and that's one of the things i have to deal with like if i capture an image with dc tv that it's got rectangular pixels so when you bring it into a, onto a modern computer it uses square pixels so mm-hmm. everyone gains you know about 15 pounds and you have to correct for it <laughs> make everyone look normal again <laughs> i went i actually went to an arts and science college it's not strictly speaking an amiga story but it's a fun commodore story so i didn't want to bring my 64 with me because back then i mean nowadays the 64 is like you could you could trip over one walking down the street um, but back then, like my 64 was like, that's valuable to me. I'm not bringing that to college. I don't want it to get stolen. So I got a plus four. Oh. And I was taking for distribution a, a drawing and painting class. And we had to take something that was commonplace and draw it in such a way that it didn't look quite like not realistic. So I'm looking around the room. I'm looking around the room like, what can I draw? What can I draw? What can I draw? And I, I'm just, there's my plus four sitting there on the desk. And I'm like, oh, I'll draw. Like, I'll get really close in there on the keyboard. So I'm drawing the keys. I'm drawing the keys. I'm drawing the keys. I'm drawing the keys now. There was a reason why I'm not an artist. Um, that's because when I hang it up on the wall and the teacher's going down the, the paintings and the, the drawings and he looks, looks at mine and he goes, oh, look at this. Look at what this person did. They took something, a keyboard that's a regular thing. Everything's even, regular. And look how it's just got this flow to it. It's got a flow to it because I can't draw a straight line. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, oh, yes, yes, I'm a genius. I'm a genius. <laughs> yeah, that's why I never got into art. See, if I had an Amiga back then, it probably would have helped me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um so you you gained quite some fame with your shows and that guru meditation thing. You are pretty active. Well, I think the crazy thing was, I don't think we thought much about it until Bill had the idea of let's do a video of us like getting our stuff ready for VCF East. We're going to go to VCF East like next week. Let's let's throw up a video. So, you know, we do just a wacky little video of us getting our stuff together. And I think that's the one where I, I bench press the Amiga 2000 or something. I don't remember. It might have been that one or it might have been the next one. But, you know, I'm, we're always doing something a little wacky in it. And when we show up at VCF, people are like, you know, normally you go to VCF, you're setting up. People aren't really talking much. Everyone's doing their thing. They're getting their cable set up. And people are like, oh, hey, hi. <laughs> like, yeah what the <laughs> and it's they everyone had seen this video because i apparently did the, the guy setting up the show sent something out about it or something and i just think everybody saw this video so everyone was like wow that was a great idea it's great video and it was just like people are actually watching our stuff yeah 
Yeah, so, yeah fame fame might be a strong word <laughs> yeah but um, big fish in a but, little pond i think we might actually be little fish in a little pond i don't know <laughs> but um yeah but it's just been cool man like anthony and i we don't do it to be whatever like popular or anything we just do it because it's fun and we we, we like to hang out like if we really wanted to be like popular we would do other things besides amiga but we don't really care. We love Amigas. So that's what we do. And, you know, we would also, like, be, like, feeding the YouTube algorithm because that's, like, that's a big part of it. <laughs> that's a really big part of it. And we don't really care. We just kind of make a video whenever we feel like it and whenever we want to, which is the complete wrong way to do it if you want to gain a lot of followers. But we don't care. We just want to have fun with it and do our own thing. <laughs> and and whoever whoever finds us and enjoys it, is that's just awesome. We, we love it. But, it, you know, it's definitely, like, more is definitely more has come from it than I ever expected. I mean, one of the one of the really amazing things was uh, getting flown down to uh, Georgia for Vintage Computer Festival Southeast. We were on this. Uh, the, we did a, a keynote session with uh, Zach Weddington, the director of Viva Amiga, and Trevor Dickinson, uh, who you know we all know Trevor Dickinson from Aeon, creator of the the um, next generation Amiga X5000. Um, Glenn Keller was also on the panel who created the oh, Paula chip, which is the sound chip in the, in the Amiga. So there was like, we're like, wow, like, what are we doing? Like on the stage with these guys, like, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So meeting that Dave was, Pleasance. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Dave Pleasance, you know, making videos for, for friends, his, um, his new company that he's, uh, he's working with. So, you know, we never, never imagined that it would lead to, to so many things, you know, yeah. and that's really, that's all we care about. Like, I, I, you know, as a filmmaker myself, like I, I find it a little bit disturbing these days how people kind of like judge you based on the amount of likes you get or the amount of views you get or the amount of subscribers you get. It's a little bit strange because I see lots of people in videos with lots of subscribers or lots of views and, and the videos are either not good or very like disrespectful or they're just kind of crappy. And meanwhile, there's other videos and other people who are making like really quality stuff that don't have a lot of subscribers or don't have a lot of views, but they they really hit home with me and I could tell that the person who made it had a lot of passion and a lot of skill and a lot of talent. So you just kind of like the numbers are just numbers, man. <laughs> like, right. and I don't really care about them. Like, and then right. when it comes to the guru, like I said, it's an excuse for me and my friend to hang out and, you know, and share, share our fun and our, of our hobby, you know, with other people. And, uh, it's just been awesome. <laughs> yeah. Right. We, just... we know we're in a niche little niche market here and, you know, it's only going to be so popular. And so that's, I think, if we did it for that, we'd probably be, you know, unhappy most of the time. <laughs> it's that we're doing it for a different reason. It's just, again, like, like uh, I mean, Bill was down here in Florida, um, and I drove three hours each direction just to go have dinner with him. I mean, that's, that's, that's how much we like hanging out. Uh, I thought it was going to be only two hours each direction, but <laughs> it was three. I drove from one coast to the other. So I drove across the entire state. Um, that's that's what we, you know, it's just that's we we just enjoy it, and so and so of course we enjoy doing the videos. So, like I said, I mean, I think I think if no one at all watched them, we'd probably be a little bit like, why are we bothering? But you know that some people are watching them. Like we wouldn't care if it even if just the people in Wog watched them. Like even just those two other guys who went to WOG, as long as somebody was watching, you know, uh, I think we were more than happy, you know, doing them just for ourselves and that little tiny group of people. Yeah, and I, I feel like they do have a, a certain. Um, you were talking about having to go back and relearn a lot of this stuff. Um, I, I feel like the videos are also really useful for people that uh, don't really know the machine. Like I just. I got my first Amiga, you know, a year or two ago, and I have no idea what I'm doing. And so a lot of it comes down to watching watching videos, a lot of your videos, to try to figure out like what am I doing with this? What can I do with it? And how do I how do I set it up? And 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 that's the kind of thing that that you show a lot of is 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 how you manage to do this stuff. So it's like if I if I wanted to get one of these things, you know, the 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 chroma key or, or you know whatever it was called like this is kind of a walkthrough on how to do it when there's really documentation wouldn't even help because i don't know how the machine works that's uh, awesome that's really great to hear you know we that's uh it's nice that people are actually our videos are actually helpful <laughs> yeah uh, so that's, that's oh, yeah. really awesome to hear and you know and like you know at the end of the day like i i wish we could make more videos like i, I would love to make more videos it, it's just 
these videos take a lot of time. So I and I never want to feel his the, time. Yeah, <laughs> they take a massive amount of time. And, you know, I've got a job and a wife, so it's hard to, to balance it all out. Um, so I would I wish I could make more videos. But the bottom line is like Andy and I are in it for, for the long term. You know, we made our first video back in 1997 at the Trenton Computer Festival. That was like really the first like guru meditation video. And we've been making videos ever since. Um, you know, so we're, we're, no, we're not going to be pumping out a video every week or multiple videos a week to feed that YouTube algorithm. But you know what? Like 10, 15, 20 years from now, if, if we're still here, we'll probably still be making videos. So oh, <laughs> we're, yeah. in it, we're in it for oh, the yeah. long haul. <laughs> we're not going to get burned out. We're just going to keep it going and we'll do more, hopefully, quality versus quantity. Well, see, <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, there's so many different pieces of hardware, pieces of software. I don't think you could ever really run out of material. Because there's just so many different little niche things. Like I, I mean, I picked up a a controller for a laser light show that hooks up to an Amiga 1000. Like who, whoever even thought there was hardware like that? It's like right. it's it's just so. And it's like okay, well, at some point I'm now I've never plugged this thing in. Um, I'm almost a little scared to, but at some point I'm gonna plug it in, and and I'm gonna plug it in when Bill has the camera on it, because. Mm-hmm. You know that's the cool reason to do it, and and let's get let's get some video of us trying to figure this thing out, and, you know, figure out different things. The device that broke my Amiga. <laughs> well, and that <laughs> that could quite possibly be the case. <laughs> as long as we capture it, as long as we capture it on video. <laughs> right. That, yeah. That's why I that's why I got three one thousands to safety in other people's hands so that you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like the like the Berlin airlift uh, to get them <laughs> rescued, so that they they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't be suffering. And uh, I still don't know which one's going to be the guinea pig for that device. <laughs> it's got I mean, it's, got, it's got its own power supply. <laughs> yeah. I got, it's really interesting though because the the whole thing with the the YouTube channel is I guess it's helped me like outside of Amiga as well. I guess helped me in life because. I gotta tell you, I, I spent I've spent my entire life behind the camera, so I never really had a, a perspective on what it's like to be in front of the camera. And I'll never forget, like the first time we did a Guru video, and I was there, like unboxing this 1200 that I just got from my friend Pierre. Like it was it was rough, man. Like it was I was like, oh my god, like this YouTube thing is terrible. Like uh, I, I'm people are gonna hate this video. I'm I'm awful <laughs> on camera, and I was. <laughs> But by doing the videos on Guru Meditation and by doing these live streams, it's really helped me. Like communicate in life, you know. Like I've I've analyzed myself. I've analyzed the way I talk. I see. I still have like a lot of improvement to make, but I can now communicate with my clients better. When I do pitches to ad agencies, I have a lot more confidence. And it sounds crazy, but I actually like channel the the things I've learned by being on camera for Guru Meditation, and it's it's really helped me communicate a lot and sort of like come out of my shell. So I don't necessarily need to hide behind the camera anymore. I know that that there's people out there who can who are willing to listen to me and. I, I'm used to like watching myself now in the edit room, so I learn how to communicate more clearly and and better. So it's it's really neat that it's, it's helped me like in in the real world, <laughs> in real life as well as just you know my hobby. So that's been that's been really nice. And I got you know just want to say like thanks to like of course all of our viewers, but you know anyone that goes out and like makes a YouTube video or makes a podcast, like it's kind of scary. Because people on the internet can be can be really rough and can be really mean. So anyone that's yeah. like doing this and trying to keep this uh, these these old machines alive, whether it's with a YouTube channel or a Twitch stream or a podcast, like I, I give you <laughs> two two thumbs up, man. Like a big pat on the back because it takes a lot of work and a lot of courage to do it because it's not easy stepping in front of that camera, putting yourself out there, regardless of what you're doing, man. It's it's not easy at all, and it takes it takes courage and practice. Well, and and I hate to I hate to bring the energy down, but I think it is worth saying is uh, there's a lot of negativity on the internet. Anything you do, no matter how good it is, you could cure cancer and figure out how to make people live 700 years. Someone's going to write a nasty comment under that video. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. it's it's and I think it's probably if you allow yourself to to take some of that to heart you're going to get discouraged very quickly so i would say to anybody who's who's doing something whatever you're doing is worthwhile i don't care what you're doing even if you're just you know shooting video of yourself trying you know playing ball with your cat you know what 
Um, you know, you just gotta just uh, ignore. The best thing is just to ignore and and don't let stuff like that get to you and just do what you want. And and you know, let other people figure themselves out if they wanna if they wanna be negative all the time. You're, you're not gonna change them, so don't get into an argument with them. That's the worst thing you could probably do is you just if you just ignore it. Chances are they'll go they'll go piss on someone else's video. <laughs> well, the thing is, the thing is, there's a lot of bullshit going on. I know our editor, um, Kevin Castiles, um, he refuted in a video the Z64 Reloaded, and somebody wrote a comment on it, not like, "No, it's a main board. It's not a motherboard, because no. if it was so, a so motherboard, I mean, yeah. it would have um, other boards connected to it." Mm. Then it's a motherboard. Otherwise, it's a main board. And well, I'm like, okay, I'm I'm an IT professional myself. I work in this business, and I know this is not true. The main board and motherboard is the exact same thing. It's just a different word. Well, but know? even even if you're going to go by that argument, then any cartridge you plug into it is a daughter board, because that's right. basically it's a little little tiny board yeah. in the cartridge. So yeah. so 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 I said it's it's bullshit, but but you know, well, tr try try to train a troll you know um you cannot you cannot uh, teach them it's seriously um so people just thing. like to be pedantic and oh, you wow. know any tiny flaw in anything you do and you know you... Or, or or another example just to complete it was um ralph bear interview people one person was asking so why is there no day known where the magnivox was released the exact day I was like, because nobody wrote it down in history back then. Nobody cared. I'm like, that cannot be. The info must be available somewhere. I'm like, well, if nobody recorded it, where do you get this uh, information from? Ralph Beer is dead. You cannot get this information anymore. And then it's like, nah, this can't be. You are just doing review. Re uh, you're just doing bad research. You didn't search long enough. I'm like, well, it's the same like boxes. When people put, uh, put package tape over boxes, you know, nobody would do this nowadays because we know the boxes are worth it. But back in the days, you wouldn't know this thing was was worth something or nobody thought about it that somebody like 50 years later would want to know the exact date the Magnavox was released. So it's just it's just bullshit sometimes, you know, Right. these these were just I mean, to the companies, these were just products. These were just right. another product. They were going to have another product to replace it next year. I mean, if you talk to the engineers, that they were working, and you you kind of see like a lot of the engineers, and it's amazing that we've gotten to talk to a few, um, and even had a few dropped on us. I, I want to like, talk inter at BCF. interject. My my favorite ever video that that you did was when you're taking apart an A4000 and you're like I don't know why they did it like this and then Bill Hurd pops up and he's like Yeah you want to tell it to this guy again? he designed it <laughs> yeah. yeah and I, I but I thought the best the best and I watched that video a lot and I, I show a lot, that video to a lot of people it's one of my favorites um, that and 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 the video going down in my own basement which I should be embarrassed of. But um, I, I I do love showing those those videos. But what the best thing was him just his answer. He's just standing there going, "Well, they're wrong." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just the best answer I think he could have given to anything. And he's like, "Well, I don't really remember." And and it's we see it with them. And you figure you figure. I mean, we love this machine. You figure, oh, the engineers would be like even super into it. But you know. To them, this this was a product they were working on. This yeah, was their job, job yeah. and and after they were done with that product, they were they were moving on to the next product. I mean, I was floored that he was he was looking in that machine to find his initials, like he hadn't seen those initials on that board in person in a number of years, and he was right. he was actually excited and looking to see where the initials were. It's mm -hmm. You know, it's you can even that you can even bring back excitement to the person who designed the machine is is pretty amazing. And we had we had a similar thing with uh, with the woman who wrote Music Mouse, the program. And uh, and I knew we were going to meet her. And so I'm kind of thinking, well, what can I do? What can I do? And I, I what I did, I threw the Amiga emulator on my Android tablet and I threw her program on it. And I was I was standing there chatting with her, and I say, "Oh, take a look at this." And she was like, "Oh my God, how did you get my program on that tablet? 
that's my program. How did you get it on there? You, you can really do that? She was amazed. And and uh, it's just that you can bring amazement to these people who I think did <clears throat> much more amazing things than I do. I mean, she wrote Music Mouse. I mean, that program mm-hmm. is incredible. <laughs> I mean, even to this day, that program is amazing. And, and that you can you can impress that person with something so simple is like, wow, it, it really is a game changer. And that's just another like reason to love doing this kind of stuff, to love <laughs> like playing around with this kind of stuff. Right. Just circling back, though, to the, the incident that you guys were talking about for anyone that hasn't seen the video. Um, and so we were at Vintage Computer Festival East and on the Friday, uh, the Vintage Computer Festival East is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And Friday is all a day of classes and lectures. So Anthony was giving this like very basic um, Amiga repair class. Like, hey, you you know, you pulled your Amiga out of the closet after being there for, for 20 years. You know, like what, what are the first things you should do to, to kind of bring it back to life? And he had an Amiga 4000 there that wasn't working. And he was complaining uh, about the capacitors, the way the capacitors uh, were, were installed on the machine. He was saying that they uh, they were installed backwards. And in the room was uh, Bill Hurd, who's at Vintage Computer Festival East every year, and he's the designer of the Commodore 128. And all of a sudden, like Bill Hurd, you know, like runs out of the room, and, like he just vanishes from Anthony's class. Um, and then uh, he comes back in with this really large man <laughs> and wearing, and, wearing, like, and, yeah, wearing and a, a Commodore huge, T-shirt. A with huge that. grin on his face. <laughs> yeah. He, he was a very large man with a big grin on his face. And then, and, and Bill heard it, like, you know, raise his hands, like, excuse me, Anthony, you know, like, what were you saying about those capacitors? And, and he's like, oh, yeah, they weren't good. They were installed backwards. And then all of a sudden you hear the big guy, like, with his very deep voice saying, what are you saying about my machine? <laughs> it turns out he went and he, he grabbed Greg Berlin, one of the main designers of the Amiga 4000, to come into the room. And <laughs> and, and and Anthony, uh, you know, I'm sure he had to change his underwear after after the class. Because, you know, I, here we are. Like, Anthony and I are just fans. Anthony, Anthony is, like, is, like I said before, he's a Commodore genius. But at the end of the day, like, he, we're just fans. We're users. Meanwhile, like the two guys, you know, the guy who designed the Commodore 128 and the guy who designed the Amiga 4000 are, like, right there in the room. And it's like, how how are we supposed to, you know, give out good information when those two are in the room? You know, <laughs> it was just one of those moments that you could never plan. It was it was, uh, it was quite remarkable. And then of course, it turns out that Greg Berlin is like the nicest guy in the universe, and he was like so excited to talk to Anthony and see his four thousand. And like Anthony was saying, looking for his initials on the motherboard because all the engineers and designers put their initials on the motherboard, which is really cool. <laughs> but it's also so. kind of amazing that you actually have a person who designed the machine is there with you trying to diagnose what's wrong with it. And he reached in at one point, the machine's on, and he reaches in and just starts pushing down on the motherboard with his finger while it's on, like pressing down on it. And, uh, well, well, first of all, of course, as Bill said, I mean, that was a real, like when he was dropped on me, um, that was that was the Ralph Cramden hamina 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 moment, <laughs> and now I'm standing there and this guy is leaning over the machine because he's he's super tall, and he's pushing on the motherboard and anybody else I'd be like what the hell are you doing get away from my machine are you nuts, and I I, I literally almost did and I'm like wait a second, <laughs> yeah this guy is Greg Berlin he he designed this thing he probably touched more four thousands than I have I think I should I should let him let him do what he's doing. Like what's the worst he can do. And I think that was the first time we also kind of broke out of just being Bill and me. And that was, again, I mean, a lot of things have come from just Bill pushing me because I'm the same way. I'm, I'm not super comfortable talking in front of people. And um, I've had a few things besides guru meditation that have got started to get me out of that. But the bill's like, we should see if he'll do an interview. We should see if he'll do an interview. And I'm like, I've never asked anyone to do an interview. How do I even ask someone to do an interview? Like, I'm not comfortable doing this. But it's like, here's our only opportunity. I mean, he's standing right there. It's like, this is like such a golden opportunity to let it slip through your fingers because you're uncomfortable. But I'd probably look back on that day and always regret it. So I'm like, finally, I'll go up to him and I'm, I probably I probably sounded like some six year old in, you know, at elementary school trying to ask for, you know, an extra bottle of paint or something. I'm like, uh, would you like to could, would you think? Uh, and he's like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, it's no big deal. You know, why are you so uptight about it? I'm not. <laughs> and and yeah, that was, I think, our first interview. And and it's like, again, it's just made me like impressed in what with what I can 
actually accomplish sometimes. You have to promise me one thing, because you 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 mentioned both before that you like to be recognized, and H A has this problem, and he's recognized <laughs> on the show like oh Scene World, H A from Scene World. He's oh, like no he's please get away, get away. So you have to you have to teach H A how to get comfortable with being known. Yeah, it's I mean it's like you know when you put so much work and effort into it, it's just nice to get a little recognition. You know, it's just H-A people appreciate it. It's so I, I don't I it's cool, but it's not why we do it. it. It just feels good, you know, when when something like that happens, knowing that people you know appreciate all the time and effort you, you see, put into H-A, something. That's the way. That's the yeah, way how see, to look at. See, it's it's a very it's a it's a strange um sensation because like the part I still have a problem with is uh, like self self promotion. I, I don't yes. like like after after we make a video like I. I feel awkward like posting it, on, you know, to like in like a social media group or a Facebook group. Yeah. I just, I'm like, man, like, I don't know. I just, I still have to get over that. I don't like to be, feel like, I don't want to be like that guy who's like right. self promoting himself. Fortunately, oh, now yeah. we have oh, enough, yeah. enough followers where we can. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about his dark totally YouTube different. videos. <laughs> yeah, totally you know. Totally different. I'm like, like if, if we did something like, look at this, Scene World produced something again. I'm yeah, happy Eric about has everything. No problem with that. I have I I'm happy about everything we publish. If it's Andrew's un, unboxing videos, AJ drilling a hole into a case or something, I I, lo- I love that. I love that. Spe- I love speaking of that, there there is a huge amount of interaction now with Commodore's designers and their their stuff. You know, I, I drilled a hole in my 128 like an idiot and broke it because it's I was impatient. Fix it, actually, <laughs> yes, I, I did. I did. But but. Also at VCF East, um, I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, Bill Hurd's standing right there. He designed the thing. Why don't I ask him? You know, and it's like it's it's so weird to have like this these personalities that you've you've heard of. You know, you you do the 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 um the sys command on the 128 and you know the names pop up or or whatever that is. Like you've you've heard of these people before and they're standing here, like you can actually you know, I think I'm Facebook friends. Like I can just send the dude a message, and it just blows my mind at this point that there's such a such an interaction with the original designers and the people that were behind this now. Oh yeah, yeah. big time. I mean, yeah, like like Anthony was saying, like it was just so wild that you know here in walks in Greg Berlin, you know, designer of the 4000, and he's just as excited to see the machine as Anthony, and we have access to these people, and you know, we've gotten to know them now, and even, you know, Glenn Keller, designer of the Paula chip, it's like, we're just sitting there having a beer, with I'm like, this is the guy that designed, like, the Paula chip, it's, and he's, like, the nicest guy in the world, it's, and mm-hmm. we have, can call him up anytime we want, it's pretty, pretty amazing, and I think the reverse is also true, I think they're also getting a blast out of us, you know, all the people who create content in, like, the retro community, they're like, oh my god, like, I made this machine, you know, 30 years ago, I thought people forgot about it, and now there's all these people who actually lo- still love this machine and really appreciate my work. So I think I think it does go both ways as well. Yeah, I know yeah, they I, say that like they really developed these machines expecting at most a five year lifespan on them. So you you can see that they're pretty amazed and pretty stoked that something they designed 30 years ago, people still using them and enjoying them. Like they never, again, it, it was a product and and. You know, I don't imagine like that we see that time again right now, at least in computers, because it's it's kind of become a, a throwaway thing. Like, you know, you couldn't afford to throw these machines away. So the machine they built, figuring you'd use it for five years, you know, you were still, like you said, with your 64, you were still using it, what, like 10 years later, you were still using the thing. Yeah. Yeah, you don't see the names of the designers and engineers, you know, on your iPhone or your latest Android device, you know. Like, well, designed in even, California, isn't that yeah. good enough? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like the original Mac had, you know, everyone's names on the inside cover. Of course, the Amiga 1000, you know, inside cover, J Minor, even had Mitchie, his dog's paw print. You know, there was mm-hmm. a lot of personality put into these machines and the personality of the designers were in those machines. Uh, there was a lot of a lot of passion and love in those machines. And now, mm-hmm. now it's just more of a disposable throwaway product right yeah. what's your opinion about the remade uh, computers like the c128 uh, remastered that is actually right now on pre-order for example um or or let's for example remember the c64 mini where a lot of people say that's warperware until i see it in real that uh, there are a lot of negativity against people who redesign 
those old machines. But I think yeah. at some point in 30 years, less and less old machines will still work. So you only have to shots of emulation or the redesigned, reproduced machines. Well, at least from my point of view. Right. Well, I have a, uh, I picked up the 64 Ultimate board. And, you know, I just think that it sits in the original case, that it has ports that all go, like, out the original holes. You're on the original keyboard. And, yeah, a lot of people are going to say, oh, that's not like using a 64, that you can have, like, all, well, every program ever made for the 64 on an SD card available to you instantly. Um, I think it's the most amazing thing. Like, I wish... I didn't know about the 128 one. Now I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah, because these things aren't getting any younger. And, I mean, we all right. thought, like, I know when I started collecting, I, I always thought, well, and I really picked them up to have a spare machine, figuring, well, the machine I use is going to die at some point, and then I'll have a spare that's sitting in the closet, I'll bring it out, and now I'll have my machine working again. And then you then you find out that even in the closet, there's things on them that are decaying and, and going bad and... You know, you deal with leaking batteries, then you find it, oh, there's also leaking capacitors, there's this, there's that. It's like, I think really, the much like with, with humans themselves, uh, time is the biggest enemy of all these things. And I think, it's yeah, I, I actually agree with you. At, at some point, the only way some people are going to have to enjoy these things is not going to be touching the actual thing. It's going to be touching something emulating it that's built to look like it, that's built to act like it. And and me, I'm like more the more the merrier. I, I would love to see I mean, I would love to see drop in, you know, emulated chips for each of the Amiga custom chips. So if you had a chip go bad, like with the SID chip, you buy this this little thing because no one's making Alice anymore. No one's making Lisa anymore. No one's making Agnes, Denise, Paula. You know, what are we going to do? And it would be awesome to have a little board you could drop in and, and get that machine working again. And, yeah, okay, it's not the same machine. Yeah, right. But you could either have nothing or you can have something. I'd rather have the something. Like, I don't I don't see why, you know, some people will have the perfectly stock thing and some people the, – the one thing I, I do with is, is, like, destroying a working machine. It's something I could never get myself to yeah. do. But, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it, it's great that more people are working on ways to, to keep the momentum and keep the, you know, keep this stuff going for future generations that will never have touched it, never have seen it otherwise. Well said, well said. You know, and, and another thing I hear a lot of is like, oh, it's, emulation is no good, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, Amiga Forever, you know, it's just a bunch of hooey, you know, screw those Colanto guys, whatever. But I... I could not disagree more i think it's just awesome and i've seen now so many people you know who've never had an amiga before or had an amiga and haven't touched one in 20 years pick up you know amiga forever and there's like oh my god like this this is awesome i i love it it's just like having an amiga and then all of a sudden the next thing you know they're on ebay trying to buy themselves <laughs> an amiga all because you know they got reintroduced to it or introduced to it via emulation or amiga forever it's just it's really cool to see that and like you said, well, someday, like, these machines are going to be rare. Like, you're not going to be able to have access to them. But I tell you what, you know, when you're sitting there at an emulator, it can get pretty darn close to the real thing. It's it's pretty awesome. And I also, I you know, I love, like, the Ultimate 64, you know, C64 Mini. Uh, but I also, I'm really into, I'm, I really support people, you know, like the Apollo team who are making things like the Vampire and FPGA yes. boards. Like, I don't poo-poo any of that stuff like anyone like who puts that much time and effort into making something new to like breathe new life in these old machines and keep them alive keep people interested in them like that's great like if you're not if you're personally not into it that's fine like, i get it but but the fact that they're but doing it is is great <laughs> because some people right. are going to be interested in it and it is going to keep some people very much interested in their machines so there's i'm 100 percent for all this this new fpgas and 64 minis and you know mega forever win uae like bring it i want it all like bring it all like i want as much possible <laughs> i wish what i wish is that the people who like i know there's some people who don't like the vampire because it's not an 060 it's something else okay you're right it's not why do you gotta downplay it why do you gotta talk bad about it 
But you got to jump on every thread about it and mention all the deficient, what you feel are deficiencies. Why does that have to be your goal in life to keep beating these people down with a stick till finally, potentially, we've seen it in the past, mm-hmm. is the person finally goes, you know what, why am I doing this? Uh, this is just ridiculous. Uh, I'm, I'm just not going to bother. I'm going to go do something else. And, and that, I think, is the harm that that does. That's why I really wish those people would just like, look, if it's not your thing, if emulation is not your thing, if FPGA is not your thing and you want the real thing, you want the real thing, well, then go go find the real thing and find what you enjoy. Don't not enjoy something so much, you know, <laughs> why put yourself where you don't enjoy? Go where yeah, the you weird- enjoy. The weird thing with that is, is you know, I can understand to a certain degree people, you know, when they talk about like like the SID chip being being emulated, you know, it's, it doesn't sound like the original SID chip. OK, granted, there is a certain thing with that. But the Amiga, I mean, you could have any number of, of CPUs. You could have from a 68000 to a 68060. There are some with PowerPC. There are some with all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, if they just make... You know, what? what's the Apollo, like, an emulated 68080 or some yeah, nonsense? They, they've called it the 080. They just, yeah. yeah, they made up a number, which, again, right. it's it's their thing. It's what they wanted to do. It's their jam, and they're the right. ones making it, so. Exactly, right. and and like I said, there's any number of CPUs that you could have thrown into the Amiga, you know, back back in the day and, and currently. So this is just another, this is just another one. And, yeah. you know, to... It's not like it's not like there's like a purity thing of like this is what all Amigas had because they all had different stuff and nobody had a stock Amiga. But this thing is big. I remember we were the only guys back in the day that would talk to Darren Mailburn about the 64 oh. Mini because nobody else wanted. And now and now with the 64 Mini you can load some of your own uh, disk files on it. So all of a sudden everyone's loving it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know I know that we yeah we did this phone call uh, you, you know this AJ uh, over the phone to the Spanish hotel uh, during yeah. during his holidays to get some promotion to the retro fans out there about the C64 how it was called back then. Well, if I felt like really sorry for him, you know, that everybody was um, hitting on the Indiegogo campaign. Yeah, yeah, um, because the keyboard wasn't going to be an actual keyboard. Well, how are you going to type on that little thing anyway? <laughs> you know, right, it's yeah, like yeah. this is what he's making. He's making a little uh, game machine. I mean, I have the Atari flashback. I have the Coleco flashback. I have the Intellivision flashback. And, you know, yeah, I had Atari 2600 back in the day, so the Atari has a, a connection for me. But Coleco and, and Intellivision have a connection for me, too, because they were around back then and they were the other cartridges you'd see on the shelf. So now, hey, I can play those games. It's it's OK. Yeah, it's not in real Intellivision, but it's like would I want to buy. A, I think I think the best thing I heard once was uh, the guy who made the Kim Uno and the Pi DP8. Um, uh, I mean, I can't. This guy's got to be super intelligent as far as I'm concerned. Um, that he designed these things. And I actually picked up the Kim Uno from him. And then I met him at BCF East. He was there showing off his Pi DP8. I didn't even realize it was the guy till I was talking to him. I'm like, oh, you're the guy who made the, the Kim Uno. Wow, holy cow, I'm meeting you. And he said, I said, how did you come up with this? And he said, "Is I have friends who are into these machines and I see them and they own a, a PDP8 and, or a Kim one and sitting there spending more time trying to figure out why it's broken than they are playing with it. I just want to play with it. So he brings out this, yeah, it's not the thing, but you can get this little thing that's cheap, $25, $30, and you can see what it was like to play with a Kim Uno, to use a Kim, Uno, right. a Kim One. And and it's like, there's, I think there's a place in the world for that. Uh, yeah, I think there'll always be a place in the world for that. I think that's awesome. I, I'm looking forward to the Mega 65. I can't wait to see that okay. thing. I can't wait to have it sitting on my desk. And that's another problem. People are arguing that yeah, F- FPGA is another form of emulation. It's not. It's, it's implementation. But try to teach people the difference. You know? If, if yeah. Commodore and Amiga kept going as a company, never went bankrupt, I guarantee you there'd be FPGA stuff in the brand new Amigas that came out. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. That's a technology that was not available then that's available now. You know, how many chips would be made in FPGA instead of them fabbing chips? 
if they could do it in an FPGA, it was fast enough, it was good enough. I, I guarantee you, Commodore, you would have chips in your Amiga that were FPGA. That, that's where we are. It's where we'd be. We, we'd have SD readers on them. We'd have solid state hard drives in them if, if it continued. So why not yeah. use the new technology? I mean, Amiga was all about new technology. I mean, you bought, like you said, no one had a stock Amiga. The first thing you started looking at when you had your 2000 was, oh, when can I afford an 020 board? When can I afford an 030? You know, when when can I afford a, a video card? It, you know, you are always looking at what's the what's the new technology that I can put in this thing. Uh, right, so right. Uh, I don't think the Amiga should stagnate because it it wasn't stagnant. Yeah, it, it was a, it was a platform. We were we had different you know the uh, 2000 was it that where they were saying it was that thing shouldn't be obsolete for you know like 20 years or something because you can just keep upgrading it to keep it you know current when it first came out they said that but that's not what ended up happening oh well, yeah i mean it, it was still so tied into motorola but i mean the, the mm. thought was there their their right. thought was uh, we're going to make a machine that that you can that can keep up um yeah eventually you're going to have to replace it there's some things that are you know that you yeah. can't make faster and at that point yeah that point you're going to replace it you're going to get the new machine and then you're going to start doing the same thing with that you're going to start running the race with that until that is unsuitable and then you're going to get the next machine just like the australian um campaigns on television are you keeping up with the commodore yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because commodore is keeping up with you <laughs> oh yeah most brilliant ads <laughs> <laughs> The guy is sitting next to the pool with his martini. Oh, yeah. And, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the S664 not even plugged in. Yeah. 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 So Can you imagine what, him lugging it there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So so what is your um, view on the Amiga um, community or, 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 or kind of scene right now? Because uh, we've talked to, to some people, and, and they've sort of thought it was lacking a little bit. Like, it's not as active as, like, the 64 or or Atari and whatnot. And I'm seeing some some life recently with, you know, the vampire stuff and uh, the stuff the individuals Witcher. putting out, yeah. with, like the ACA I, and everything. I think it's I think it's blowing up. I mean, compared to what it could be, it's it's blowing up where you can get a modern accelerator. You can get, and it's, if you don't want the vampire, you can get the terrible fire. You know, you can drop a compact flash adapter in. You can, you know, they got the SCSI to SD. Um, where you can drop an SD card in the 3000. That's this one. I have one here. I haven't put it in my 3000 yet. That's going to be a little project of mine. And then there's the the brand new games. And yeah, maybe there's not. See, I think, and, and and it's something I read, and it was one of the problems the Amiga had was that the jump from 8-bit to 16-bit is a significant jump in complexity in trying to program it. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I think you're always going to get more people who are going to more easily get it, be able to get into programming the Atari 8-bits, the Commodore 8-bits. It's a simpler system. It's easier to do, and it may be adequate enough for their game, and, and that's going to be their thing. Um, so I think there's always going to be more programmers in that space and more new little games coming out and stuff. But, uh, you know, I think... It's heartening to see that you see you do see a lot of that still in the Amiga, and you do still see a lot of pieces of hardware. I don't, like I said, I there's more hardware that I would love to see that you are seeing on the 8-bit. You're seeing like the PLA replacement boards. Mm -hmm. You're seeing, like I said, the SID replacement boards, where they're they're realizing there that they want the machine, but they know that components that you can't get anymore are going to fail, and you need a way to replace them and whatever that way is you know no one's got a chip fab that they're going to want to and i you know no current chip fab has the technology to put out these old chips they just they've moved on so right you're not going to build a fab to make you know old chips for 8-bit computers you got to find a new way to do it i wish i wish there was starter. more of that <laughs> yeah let's do kickstarter creating our own fab fabric <laughs> yeah. um chip fabrication yeah, yeah. <laughs> old I mean, old school we'll reverse engineer all the like the antic the sid the yeah the you know the amiga custom chefs and it will be your source <laughs> <laughs> i'm not really like into the other communities 
so I can't really compare them. I'm pretty much like just just in the Amiga community, but from my perspective in the Amiga community, there, there's so much going on, man. It's, it's it's really impressive. Like I said, you know, just looking at our user group, for many years there was just like four of us. And now we've got like 30 different members. And you know, like I was mentioning before, I do this Twitch stream once a week, and like the amount of people that come into those streams and like hang out is is remarkable. And the fact that like every week I have something new to show, like that is just mind boggling. I'm, I never expected this. If you go on to lemonamiga.com, like one of the one of the great uh, Amiga Amiga websites, they um, uh, Proceda he made a post about all the games that came out for the Amiga in 2018, and the list is really long. <laughs> and I think it's just like picking up steam more and more every year. And the Amiga community is also like a very very tightly knit community like everyone knows each other everyone's like super passionate everyone you know is very very supportive i i just love getting together going to amiga events there's an amiga 34 event coming up in germany which i'm hoping to go to i know like, amiga i will go to i got all, my I ticket already awesome and i know amiga ireland is like meeting next week uh we still have you know westchester amiga user group here in in uh in new york and we have amy west so I think I think Amiga, there's a lot going on in Amiga, you know, in addition to all of like the amazing new hardware you mentioned before, like the vampires and the ACAs. Uh, there's a new Amiga store that opened up in the United States called Amiga on the Lake. They opened up a couple of years ago mm -hmm. and they're they're supporting Amiga. They're they're selling the new uh, Amiga cases from A1200.net. They're selling the new keycaps that are being made from A1200.net. Uh, they're selling, you know, look, we had uh, an update to the Amiga OS released in 2018. We've got yeah. 3.1.4 now. We got new Kickstarter chips. We got a new OS. You know, there's there's a lot. Mm -hmm. We just got an update to Amiga Forever, which is now Amiga Forever 8 that just came out about two weeks ago. So I think there's there's a lot happening in the Amiga community. Again, I can't compare it to others. Maybe maybe the 64 scene is more active. It's very, very possible. But it's not like the, there's not much going on in the Amiga scene. There's, there's a lot going on in the scene. And I love getting together with other Amiga users. It's... I've met Amiga people from from Europe. I've met Amiga people from all over the world, and every time we get together, it's just like it's just it's a big party. It's just really really wonderful. <laughs> I I feel like Amiga draws a very you know all all draws all kinds of people. A lot of like really creative people because Amiga really was a multimedia machine. So there's so many computer for the creative mind. <laughs> it really was. So and it, so every time you get together at an Amiga event, it's it's. Uh, Lots of really, really cool people there. I was just down at MAGFest last weekend, the Music and Games Festival in Washington, D.C. It draws about 25,000 people per year. And uh, my friends from Poland flew in. The guys who do the uh, the Riverwash demo scene party in Poland, they're trying to introduce America to the demo scene. Uh, and my friend Brendan Becker, Inverse Phase, was kind of like the liaison here in the States for it. And they're all Amiga guys. And it was just so cool. Like when we get together and <laughs> it's it's just so much fun. They're such good guys. And it's like you already have that Amiga connection. And they're just really cool people who love to like hang out, uh, share your passion for the Amiga and have a great time. Like And and they're such cool people that I just become friendly with them outside of Amiga. And, you know, the Amiga just is like an excuse to hang out. But really, you're hanging out with these guys because they're really nice people and they're 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 great to socialize with. So I, I, I love Amiga community. But I have to say a big but. There are also negative sides True. of the Amiga, and there's just one word: lawsuits. <laughs> that is true. That is very, very true. And yeah. and I and 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 what what shocked what shocked me was that it even seems to swap swap over to the C64 scene in a way because um, Gideon Schweitzer was forced to remove all the FPGA programming of the Ultimate 64. And so when you did the firmware update, your computer stopped working, and you and you saw a screen like, please get your uh, your. Well, it was just the ROMs, not the FPGA. It was just the, the okay, the ROMs. Yeah, the, the ROMs. Okay, yeah, right. Okay, uh, but anyway, it, sh it shocked me that you had to, you know, um, get it from somewhere on the internet, put it on a um, flash drive, and then get your ultimate working again. And. I um, yeah, I didn't have the ultimate before then. So when I got it, you already you had to get the ROMs from somewhere, and that's the first thing you had to do as part of the setup hmm. process. So I never knew there was another process, but it doesn't shock me. And I think what seems to be what happens is as a community shrinks, the people who who own bits like it's almost like they want to they build a wall around it, like fiercely defended wall, hmm. and they're going to defend it. And, and some of it I can understand if you have something you're actually selling. Okay. Uh, you know, you want to protect that. You know, people should 
because sometimes money is what makes new things happen. You know, Cloanto keeping up Amiga forever, they wouldn't bother if no one bought it, if they didn't make any money on it. You know, we don't live in a utopia where people just work for nothing just because they feel like doing it. Um, so I, I can understand that, but I can never understand the fiercely defending something that doesn't mean enough for you to do something with just because you own it, you want to defend right. it. Um, and, and Amiga's Amiga's a tough, you know, a lot of people saying, oh, just open source the OS, just open source the OS. Well, part of the problem there was Commodore themselves, where Commodore didn't own all the parts of the operating system. They licensed a lot of things from other people. So you can't just open source things that are other people's property because they need to give their permission. And like I noticed with the Mega 65 where, and I'm actually glad um, because I know I used to go on the website a lot. You'd see the progress bars of each different thing. And you'd always see that, that tiny little progress getting the rights to use the Commodore name. And now that's, that's been removed. They've given up on that. And I'm like, thank God, because we might actually see it produced. If you just give up that idea, it doesn't have to have the Commodore name on it. It doesn't have to have the Commodore logo on it. If it looks and feels like it, uh, that's good enough. Um, let's, let's just get it in our hands. I want it in my hot little hands. (laughs) Maybe I don't grow bigger in your little hands. Yeah, I'm not. I'm certainly not not an expert when it comes to this, and it's. But it's. It is one of the unfortunate parts of of uh, the Amiga scene is that the the Amiga IP is so divided between different parties that it's really difficult to get anything done. Like I know uh, these guys were trying to come out with something like a, an Amiga Mini. You know, not exactly that, but it was something to that idea. And unfortunately, it just got completely shut down. And there's been a lot of progress that has been halted because of the litigious issues <laughs> um, which is which is pretty pretty unfortunate um, but aside you know aside from that like the people the fans the Amiga fans in the community um, are, are amazing and that's what's you know keeping it alive and I don't know if we'll ever see a day when you know everyone can like just get along and, and not sue I don't know if we could ever have an Amiga mini but it sure would be great if we could <laughs> I'm gonna keep the faith and you know maybe maybe someday it'll be possible um, well, you know, uh, well, and know. as some people say, we do already with things like Amibian on a Raspberry Pi. You know, it's not exactly the same thing, but you know, it can be right. close to what what it was like using the original machines, or even like the Mister or, or the Mister. Mm-hmm. Mister is awesome, yeah. But you know, it's just. But there's obviously, like like Yurik said, there's a lot of legal issues in the Amiga community. It's yeah. Well, didn't so didn't three one four get? Sued or they, they they made them take it down and then they had to change something with it and put it back up or something. No, I don't. I, yeah, I I've tried to ignore the. I just honestly that stuff turns me off so much. Like I hear about three one four, I just want it. I just kind of and then suddenly you start you go on the forums and you start seeing posts with titles that are like oh 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 here we go. Yeah. It's like okay, I'm just not even gonna click on them. I'm not even gonna read them as long as I get my ROMs. As long as I get my discs, then I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be happy. But uh, it would be, I mean, I guess it would be awesome. I can, I can see, like I said, and I say like, oh, we kind of already have an Amiga Mini because we have a Mibi and we have the Mist, we have things like that. But it would be awesome to see that box in, you know, a store. Like you go yes. in Target and you see that, and that's that's I think what you have with the the flashback machines you have with like the the C64 mini is a chance that you might actually see that in a store someone might actually make some money on that and I mean you look how many Atari flashbacks there've been because there's been such a market for that thing mm-hmm. you know and they keep making a new one they keep making a better one let's do wireless controllers let's do this let's put some more games on it it's right. you know it's it's you know you're only going to see more of this stuff if people can actually do it and get it where they can actually sell it and maybe make some money on it. Yeah, I'm looking so, at this list of games. There's almost 40 games that were released in 2018 for the Amiga. And some of them are like outstanding. Some yeah. of them, like some of them, I just want to pick up and play. A lot of them remind me of some of the new Steam games that have come out that are kind of like throwback style games. Like uh, there's a new one that came out called uh, Power Glove Reloaded, which is mm-hmm. you know it's it's a update of a Commodore 64 oh. game that came out. I I love that game is so much fun to play. Uh, it's just it's awesome. We also have a new one called Worthy that came out that is uh, it's kind of like a um, an homage to Lemmings in a way. So it's like a puzzler slash arcade game, and it's really really wonderful. There's just some 
great games that came out that I, I'm just excited to play, not just because they're me games, but just because simply because they're they're great games that are fun to play. And, you know, I'd put them up. I'll, I'll boot one of those up. You know, I'll be like, you know, I really feel like playing some Worthy today instead of, you know, a current Steam game. It, they're mm-hmm. like that that quality. And that they're just getting better every year. You know, the, the, the releases that are coming out are just getting better and better. People are putting more and more time and effort into these games. It's really remarkable. Yeah, we're seeing some that are still in development, like we talked to um, Richard Löwenstein. Yeah, yeah, who, who's doing um, reshoot R? Oh yeah, yeah, that looks awesome. The 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 female voice of which is sitting on the couch over there. <laughs> oh, excellent! <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. She's, yeah, she's the one R that says like "power up" and escalation. <laughs> yeah, escalation. Oh, that's, uh, that's I, so I, cool. I just yeah, and and like like Bill says, there's something great about these old games. And even like the old style, but something great about an Amiga game was, ex- except for like the RPGs, like the Ultima games, uh, the, those games where you had to invest a lot of time. A lot of Amiga games, like I didn't have to stay up till the sun was coming up to play Settlers. I could have, I could have stopped any time. I sound like an addict, <laughs> but you know, you had where you could easy bite size. You know, each level of Settlers, you can, you can put it down. So you can play a quick game. Hey, I got a half hour to kill. I can play a quick game and not, uh, you know, so many games that come out now are just like you, you, you need to invest two, three hundred hours into this game to to get to see all of it. And and there's, and there's not and microtransactions. Oh, well. And yeah, it, it was that. And that's why I love sometimes like, uh, you know. Tower 57, where I can just load it up and and play for 20 minutes, play for half an hour, then shut it off and and go do something else. It's like that. Uh, that would be the perfect thing for tablets and phones, but you see, like that ecosystem has just been absolutely, I think, decimated by the uh, you know the microtransaction games of you're not you, you know you're not going to want to sell a game on a you know you can't sell a game on a phone for twenty dollars. And make your money just selling the game, and that's it, because no one will download it because everyone's used to seeing games that are either f- less than five dollars or absolutely free, and you just hit with buy gems, buy gems, or buy coins, buy coins, and it's. I think that that's just it was. It would be the perfect place for Amiga-like games, but it's just the ecosystem has just not it prevented that from ever happening, unfortunately. Luckily, we still have Amigas to. To play these games on. <laughs> the interesting thing for me too with the with the games is seeing how some games age better than others. Like some games are just great games and they're they're still great to play, while others where the the gameplay was maybe lacking a little bit, but it was a great like technological advancement. Like those don't age quite as well. But something has got gums. great game. What's that? Polygons, for example. Oh right. <laughs> but you know, like a, a game that's just got great gameplay and is just a, a really well thought out game is is a great game regardless of whether it's on an old 8-bit computer or an amiga or you know a modern a modern game it's just if it's got great gameplay and it's fun to play it'll, it'll last it'll just, you know last the test of time well, and i uh, remember i remember playing turbo with my friend on the amiga and i mean that game he had that on his 1000 we played that game we played that game on his 060 1200 you know that that yeah, that kind of gameplay where it just transcends. It is such a fun game to play that it doesn't matter what new games are out, what better games are out. You're going to go back to that game because your friend's over and you have fun playing it. Um, games like that, yeah, I mean, there's 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 so many on the Amiga right. that, that you could still pick up now and still have a, a, such a fun time playing. Yeah. And talking about games not aging well, I was shocked a few years ago when I learned there was a nude patch for the first Tomb Raider. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that that now, now it has replay value, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I mean, I mean, I mean, when when I when I when I bought it in '97 um, for the PC, I mean, they had she had pressed like Toblerone chocolate, you know, <laughs> the Swiss chocolate. <laughs> You know, so. <laughs> this time you just did a one eighty. Hit that the same day. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> wow. I mean, why would you want a nude patch of that? You know. Yeah. 
Yeah, my first the first game I ran into that had a that had a nude patch was Giant Citizen Kabuda. I was just trying to turn off the bubbles in Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those damn bubbles kept getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm actually super excited. They just came out with a new Leisure Suit Larry yeah. game. Uh, I know. I, it's, I, I yeah, it's I awesome. bought it. Yeah, I, awesome. I heard it's great. I haven't played it yet, but I heard it's great. I got it all ready to go. I'm like Gog. I just got to fire it up. <laughs> I heard it's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. And it's interesting how they kept the old animation, you know? Like, when I saw it, I was like, okay, this is wrong because Larry is turning, like, one frame. No, it's supposed to be like that. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> so it's really kept, like, the old, yeah, old they, style. They, they took Monkey Island and made it all 3D and weird. Like, yeah, but like Monkey Island thing. worked well when it was like a cartoon and like animated kind of like that. But then they they on the PlayStation they made it like all 3D and just, ugh, doesn't play. Is, that was the thing is, of the 90s. Yeah, it is yeah. interesting that modernizing some things works a lot better than others. Mm. I think any game that had a, a unique visual style to it, I, I think when I I feel the same way sometimes when I see it redone that vastly different i'm just like oh this game just doesn't have the same charm anymore like it yeah. loses it loses a, like that that weird charm i think mm. it's also kind of like a book you know because because the other the old games are more primitive it left a lot more to the imagination so a lot yes. of reasons why people don't like it when there's like a movie version of of a book is because you know the director had a vision of the book his or her way and it's different than the way that you experienced it so they don't like right. that so same thing with the games, you know, all those old games just leave a lot to your imagination. So now when we have more modern graphics and modern hardware and can make them much more realistic, it may not match your vision of and your experience that you had, you know, when when you were a kid. But you know, it it kind of goes back to the discussion we were having before about, you know, coming out with new hardware and software for the Amiga. Like I'm I'm all for people trying to do a reboot of a game. Like, you know what, it keeps it alive. You know, like maybe someone's going to play the the new Monkey Island and they're like, "You know what? Let me let me check out the old Monkey Island. Let me let me right. see what that was like. You know, let me go back to this Amiga thing and, and check out the original version. And a lot of the, the remakes also have the old graphics supplied as well, which is really mm -hmm. cool. I just picked sure. up uh, Gods, Gods Remastered, which, you know, Gods is a classic Amiga game. And the cool thing is, like, you can, like, in real time, on the fly, swap between the new graphics and the old graphics. Uh, and it looks just like the Amiga version when you when you switch over, and it changes the sound as well because they've enhanced the soundtrack, they've enhanced the the, uh, the sound effects, and when you hit the button, boom, you're like right back into into the Amiga world, which is which is pretty cool. So a lot of people were complaining about the way the the hero looks and whatnot, or you know their vision for what gods should be, but I, it's just cool that someone like put this much time and effort into this game, and you know it's really people with passion just trying to trying to you know keep keep these old games alive you know it's i think like shadow of the beast i think that remake was just awesome it wasn't really a remake it was more of a sequel that game is an absolute blast to play and again it also it comes with the original shadow of the beast so if you buy the new shadow of the beast on your playstation you can actually fire up the original shadow of the beast and play it so i think it's cool man I, i'm all for it like you know they don't always uh knock it out of the park but just the fact that people are trying to keep these old games alive in their own way is is very cool we we spoke about emulation earlier, and it's quite interesting that um, the PC64 from Wolfgang Lorenz 94 was actually invented because the what the, the PC64, one of the first emulators oh, okay. for the C64 by Wolfgang Lorenz, he actually um, invented that because he needed money and he was um, handicapped, and so it was just a way of making money. And this way, it created this um, emulator thing you know like um ccs 64 and and all the others and now nowadays everybody uses vice so it's interesting for me how this all started you know hmm. nobody well, he, he wasn't it's... thinking like oh maybe i should emulate my z64 he was just thinking like well um, how can i make money and well, get out of my yeah. uh, of my environment you know and well, I remember the, trying the, to emulate the 64 on my Amiga. <laughs> they had uh, 64 <laughs> emulator 2 with the little cable to hook up your 1541 drive. Oh, that was so slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, the Amiga could emulate a Mac better than a Mac could run Ooh. a Mac, <laughs> which was yes. pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, the Amiga is the fastest Mac ever made. Exactly. We should do a show on emulation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The 64 stuff, the Mac stuff. Oh man, that's a show right there. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm I, I actually I want to get that new uh that new Ultimate 64. I think it looks sweet. Is that or is that what it's called or 64 Reloaded? I can't. No, the no, board. no. The there's, Reloaded there's is uh, the Reloaded is a board you put the, the Reloaded. That's what I meant. Yeah. In. The but Ultimate got the, 64 is the FPGA remake of the entire machine, basically. Oh, that's the one thing of the Ultimate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the um, the Commodore 64 Reloaded Mark III will be the FPGA based from Jens Schoenfeld, but that is not out yet. Yeah. But it That's is awesome. in, in the planning. Yeah, it is. It's just amazing that there's there's going to be two FPGA based 64 replacement boards. Yeah. It's just a, like I know, I know. Yeah. It's a little. I, part of me thinks. Part of me is like, why? I mean, there's already one on the market. Why would you make another? It's like you're Please. just splitting the market up. Then part of me is like, cool. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Well, Jens Schoenfeld, yeah. Jens Schoenfeld says he can do it better, different. Right, and I don't that's know. it. Yeah, you don't know. I mean, there's more than one. I mean, you got Chrysler, you got GM. You, got, I mean, different people making cars different ways. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna take a slightly different path, and maybe you're gonna like that one more than the other one. And yeah, it's gonna take some sales away. Not everyone's gonna be able to buy both. But you know, if we end up with better products, he that might give some ideas. For the the next the uh, you know next version of the 64 ultimate like oh I didn't think of putting that in there let me put that in there yeah you know it's it's just that's that's the way if you only have one product on the market it's it's not gonna you know there's gonna be no push to to make it better if you have right. two you have two people pushing to make it better and and differentiate it so. I, I say, like I said, part of me is like, oh, no, really? Oh, God. Another thing I'm going to have to think about maybe saving up money for and maybe buying. And the other part of me is just like, this is so cool. I, I, and again, like I said, I wish I wish we'd have like Amiga replacement motherboards that act, that didn't require. Like, it, it's great that we have ASIL with his replacement 4000. It's great that we have the Re1, uh, Re1200s. Re But it would be great if we had boards that we didn't need the chips from that could right. go in the, in the machine and you'd have the same look, you'd have the same feel, you'd hook up the same keyboard, you'd hook up the same floppy drive. And yeah, okay, it's not the same thing in there, but as far as you can see and as far as you can touch and smell and feel it is, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to last another 30 years. Yeah. So where can people find your stuff? Well, <laughs> we have a lot, <laughs> we have a, um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of things going on. First and foremost, of course, we have our YouTube channel, The Guru Meditation. So you can go to youtube.com slash The Guru Meditation. We also have a website, which is basically just a collection of our YouTube videos. That needs a bit of updating. But that is uh, theguruMeditation.org, theguruMeditation.org. Um, we also have a Twitter account, which is at The Guru Meditate. So twitter.com uh, at The Guru Meditate. Twitter.com slash the guru meditate. I think that's it. Oh, I should um, follow our Twitter. Yeah, you can follow our Twitter. <laughs> I post all that good stuff. <laughs> um, uh, I also, uh, when I'm solo without Anthony, I stream about once a week on Twitch. So you can go to twitch.tv slash Amiga Bill. Um, Facebook.com slash the guru meditation. So we're on Facebook as well. So we got Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I'm on Twitch. Uh, we also we've got a an Instagram account that Anthony curates and um, he might he might resurrect that <laughs> now that he's been shamed. <laughs> no, you remembered I set that up. <laughs> oh, I remembered, but yeah. So <laughs> so there so there you go. YouTube's our primary spot, um, but then you know I'm very active as well on, on Facebook, YouTube, uh, Facebook.com/slash Guru Meditation, and also Twitter. I, I try and I try and post something at least every other day. Or at least yeah, retweet he's, something. He's not kidding. He's he's like yeah. He's the social butterfly on on social media. And it's kind of funny. Is I was in the process of this move down to Florida, and I I never really pay much attention to what's going on on, on our Facebook. And it and even Bill has said it kind of gets hard because if you have two people watching and posting, it's who posted it because it all looks like it comes from one place. It's almost better off if just one person handles that aspect. And, and I get this message from this guy who's going to be visiting New York from Florida and he'd like to go out. And again, we're always like, hey, you're into Amiga, you're into Commodore. Cool. Um, you're you're our kind of people. Yeah, sure. You know, maybe we can get together at some point. Hey, if you're up for a WOG meeting, um, you know, this the the second uh, or the first Thursday of the month. Hey, yeah, come to the WOG meeting and, and all that. And and I find out 
Uh, like, hey, where are you in Florida? The guy is, you know, 30 minutes from where I was moving. <laughs> and he's, he's into the Commodore, he's into the Amiga. And it's like, I'm meeting him in New York and we're going to be living near each other. It's just, it's just that I just happened to look, you know, so it's, it is, yeah, those are great ways to get in touch with us. Mm. And for those listening, don't worry, even though Anthony moved to Florida, the Guru Meditation is not going anywhere. <laughs> Anthony and I have been making videos together since 1997, and we're not going to stop anytime soon. There may not be quite as many videos, but there will still be plenty of videos that we'll be putting out. I might have to I might have to go rogue every now and then, <laughs> like this week when I'm presenting a baby castle, so that's definitely going to get recorded. But... Yeah, I'm pissed that I'm not going to be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I wish you were here, SA. But what can you do? But the, the bottom line is we're still going to get together. I, I go down to Florida. Anthony comes up to New York, especially we're at BCF mm-hmm. East. We've banked a bunch of episodes, and, you know, we're not we're not going anywhere, man. Like, we are, we're in this for the, for the long haul. We are – we've been – Amiga's been part of our lives Great. since we're 12 years old, and – it's going to continue to be. Actually, Anthony, one of the things I want to do is I want to release that video we did together from 1997 and have us have us commentate on it. <laughs> oh, that would be that would Why be not? interesting. That's going to be a fun one, yeah, because it's coming up because um, that show is coming up again in the spring, so it'll be fun to release that video this spring. Yeah, Great. yeah, it would be. That we could talk forever to you guys. This is a blast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we love having you on. We'll have to have you back on again. Well, thank you guys for having us on. It's, it's oh. awesome. Again, again, the whole reason why we do the Uber meditation is exactly for this reason, just to like hang out and meet other awesome people in you know retro community like you guys. I'm gonna see Sami uh, at the end of the week. Oh. If you have... <laughs> I gotta send that Monday. Uh, send me your address. I think that's what I need. I don't have your okay. address. I'll text it to you now. I'll I'm send gonna see it your... Monday, so you'll have it. Uh, you'll have it. You know, Tuesday. I'll, I'll overnight. I'll... Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm gonna either see her on Wednesday or Friday. Probably Friday, but. We got to, uh, I'm going to hook up her 1200, so it's going to be we're, fun. Uh, yeah, we're resurrecting her 1200. And that was another, that was another story. I mean, when, when we, we went there with the premise of we were going to do the show about her, who, I mean, this woman programmed, I mean, she bought a 1000, she learned basic and C programming just to make art. You know, she's a painter and. I saw the you know, video from Bit yeah, about right. her. Yeah. And I and I'm in I'm near I'm in her kitchen putting discs in my twelve hundred and making ADFs of them because the, the panic was she has everything on floppies and this stuff would be lost. Her artwork would be lost if those discs went bad. Right. So I'm I'm making ADFs of her floppies and then end of the evening we have all these ADFs on a compact flash card. I copy them to a USB thumb drive. We're going to give them to her, and, and Bill goes to her iMac and throws FSUAE on there. And she, lo- I think she, when she loaded up that first disc, and you see this woman's eyes just light up. Like, it was just like, wow, <laughs> you know, I can I can actually do this again. And, yeah, now she's got a 1200, and we're, uh, we're keeping her 1200 alive. That's awesome. She's 85 or something, right? Yeah, now she is. And you never know it. She acts, oh, yeah. She acts like a 30-year-old. I should be I should be that active now. <laughs> <laughs> she puts me to shame now. But yeah, her stuff, her Amiga stuff is going into the Guggenheim Museums. And there's a lot of it that we haven't preserved yet. So we got to we gotta preserve it. <laughs> it's going to the Guggenheim, baby. I'm psyched. Yes. So I'm going to see her on Friday. And we're going we're gonna to archi- finish archiving her, her nice. work. Stuff. And then bring it, to, bring it to the Guggenheim. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, the Guggenheim is a big, a big museum here in New York. It's, it's going international now as well. It's Frank Lloyd Wright designed the, the building that's in, and I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's building. Yeah, it's amazing. It's one of the, the best museums in the world, and she's gonna her Amiga stuff's gonna be in it now. She gave this awesome presentation there about two months ago. I mean, she's she's a, like world renowned painter. She's uh, one of the best Palestinian artists you know ever, um, and the Amiga is part of her her series on kinetic paintings. So, um, you know, they want to pres- they want to preserve that as well, obviously. But she's well known. You know, her main thing is painting. That's what she considers herself. And she nice. just picked up the Amiga for fun and learned how to program in C++ just just as a little side hobby. <laughs> if my grandmother was like that, oh, I'll just learn <laughs> programming for yeah. fun. No. <laughs> she wants to go to revision. She wants to she wants to enter something in revision. She's like all excited about it. Yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah, it'd be awesome. Yeah, that's... that'd be amazing. Yeah. To Germany. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because I told her about revision and how it's the big demo scene party and how she 
and she saw some of the productions that came out of it and she's like oh my god this is amazing <laughs> she's like these, these guys are awesome awesome guys well thank you so much it's always a pleasure yeah. well, thank you guys. you guys thanks for sitting with us it's been that was awesome. fun yeah. might as well go out on on the usual we'll see you on the next episode of the guru meditation <laughs> there you go awesome. why not the closer man he's the close he gets his coffee <laughs> okay <laughs> Perfect. All right, guys. Have a great one. All Thanks right, a lot. You too. Later, you guys. Thanks bye again. Bye. Bye bye. So that was the Guru Meditation. If you want to see what they're up to, you can go over to thegurumeditation.org and that'll have links to their videos and their live streams and, and events and all that stuff um, that you can see. Um, and YouTube. Yes, and YouTube. So check them out. You know who we are. You know where to get in touch with us. It's podcast at sceneworld.org. So send us your comments and stuff, and yeah. We should do like a listener mail section where we read a letter from a listener every time we do this. We don't get a lot of letters, Shh, unfortunately. Nobody knows that. Don't tell them. <laughs> anyway, yep, we'll see you next time.